In the heart of the Antares Empire's capital, Riffenheim, an atmosphere of sheer devastation prevailed. The roar of a demon echoed through the streets, sending shivers down the spines of those who dared to remain. It was a scene of utter desolation, where the cries of the wounded mingled with the sounds of destruction. Amidst this grim tableau, two malevolent demons held sway, their towering forms casting long shadows over the shattered cityscape. A man clad in white armor reported of the defeat suffered by their two million strong military at the hands of the summoned evil demon. Also soldier informed of the casualties, with 200,000 lives lost to wide-ranging magical attacks and summonings, and 300,000 left wounded. Determined to end the reign of the demonic king, the king in white armor declared that the time had come for the true heroes to vanquish the forces of darkness. His companions acknowledged his leadership with gratitude, addressing him as majesty. Meanwhile, in the heart of the demonic palace, Gerak, within the Hall of Abyss, hero Alex von Hallen confronted the malevolent ruler seated upon his throne. He declared an end to the dark ruler's nefarious deeds and urged a return to the darkness from whence he came. As the heroes stood before him, the emperor of the Antares Empire, known as Demon King Reifenhart Wald Antares, listened silently, reigning in Gyrok's heart within the Hall of Abyss. Sword St. Cyrus spoke boldly, vowing to eliminate the Demon King and put an end to the dark history of the Empire. To all this accusations, Demon King Reifenhart expressed his dismay at being dubbed the ruler of a dark empire. He playfully questioned their labeling, pointing out the irony of calling it dark when it actually has a name, Antares. He also reminded them that the sun rises in his empire too. Another figure, Marshal King Teslon, accused the Demon King of fostering demons within the empire, claiming that their corrupt nature would dissipate with his demise. Demon King Reifenhart pondered inwardly, dismissing the notion of his demons possessing inherently evil traits. He believed they were merely reacting to the mistreatment they had endured from humans because he had taught them merely human tactics. He found it ironic that they were now labeled as corrupt creatures for behaving as humans do. Leaning forward in his seat, uncertainty evident in his voice, he questioned whether the heroes had already triumphed over his four heavenly kings. In response, Sword St. Cyrus boasted of his victory over the dirty orcs, claiming they were no match for his sword. The demon lord, Reifenhart, looked worried and angry as he questioned the news of the brave orc warrior, Tathid's death, with confusion. Reflecting on his thoughts, Reifenhart acknowledged the innocence of orcs, despite their barbaric appearance, and defended their loyalty to their own kind. Despite humans, he knew that orcs are a race of hunter-gatherers. They protect the weak and fight the strong, and their honor is much higher than knights have. He found the derogatory remarks about them being dirty offensive, but sarcastically remarked that perhaps they were dirty because they didn't wash regularly. However, he still felt saddened by their demis. Marshal King Teslon spoke of the punishment dealt to the four heavenly kings, mentioning the demise of a sickening, monstrous troll, which surprised Reifenhart. Upon hearing this, the demon king couldn't help but wonder, even Guru Dathilka is dead? He questioned the harsh labels of sickness and monstrosity, considering trolls as nothing more than slightly scary-looking beings who cherished nature and spirituality. His disbelief was evident, his face contorting into an expression of mock sadness, with a tear sliding down his cheek. Saint Esfelin added that the evil dwarf who worshipped the god of dark had also met his end, prompting a reaction from Reifenhart. Placing his hand on his forehead, he expressed disbelief at Mashalan's death and criticized the arrogance of those who labeled Alpoth, the god of dwarves, as a deity of darkness. A man endowed with magical powers, identified as the Mage of Light, Jade Archlight, boasted about defeating the corrupt Dark Elf with his magic. This declaration enraged the Demon King further, especially upon hearing about Ceres meeting a similar fate as other his subordinates. He scorned them for seemingly begging to be killed. The heroes, in turn, accused the Dark Elf of having succumbed to the dark side, showing no pity towards such creatures. This only fueled the Demon King's rage further. In response, the Demon King defended the Dark Elf, explaining that she was a pure-blooded High Elf. Her darker skin was a result of environmental factors, not her alignment. He criticized the humans for deforestation, which forced her to seek refuge in barren lands, which was the reason for her tanned skin. The heroes, refusing to listen, prepared for battle, with the hero Alex Vaughn vowing to avenge the fallen warriors with his sword. The Demon King, with a smiling yet sinister demeanor and crimson red eyes, questioned why they just won't listen him and who would avenge the otherworldly dead. Alex Vaughn condemned the Demon King for corrupting the monsters with his evil powers, believing they would have lived normal lives otherwise and would be loyal slaves. It was useless to talk with heroes further. They just won't listen at all. To them, otherworldly species are nothing more than species of the dark who want to live as more than slaves. And just for that, they think that they are worth killing. 
In this case, Reifenhart was ready, ready to become the demon king they so wish him to be. And as the demon lord released the aura around him, the hero Alex Vaughn charged towards him. Turning to face the hero, Riffenhart declared that if fighting to the demon king was what they desired, then so be it. He will become the demon king what they deserved. With the aura fully released, Riffenhart began to gather energy, causing the heroes to scatter, and reminisce about his past as an ordinary great mage, noting the irony of such a title. His name is Riffenhart, and magic circles began to materialize around him as he delved into his thoughts. He was just an ordinary great mage, although being a great mage isn't very ordinary. He pondered how humans perceived otherworldly species, seeing them as inferior beings with assigned roles. Elves were viewed as beautiful servants with long lifespans, dwarves as skilled laborers and miners, orcs as menial workers, and trolls as ingredients for healing potions. In the past, this realization shocked him, leading him to delve deeper into their forgotten cultures. Then, he gradually got to know them, and their lifestyle, habits, and magic skills. He even got to learn magic from the elves and sorcery from the trolls. By combining them, he was able to reach ten-circle magic for the first time in history. Continuing to engage with otherworldly races, his perspective on life underwent a transformation, and witnessing their mistreatment, he could no longer stand idly by and began rescuing them. For that, he funded a small, peaceful kingdom on the wild and barren lands. As his territory expanded, it became harder to treat humans, and they grew wary. Eventually, humans sent knights to raid and loot their lands. They were forced to move elsewhere. Despite their efforts to defend themselves, they inadvertently seized more land, leading to the establishment of the Antares Empire. However, he clarified that his actions were not fueled by hatred towards humans. Rather, he believed that otherworldly species were equal to humans. Refusing to retaliate against humans, he lamented the bloodshed that ensued. Despite the prosperity of Antares, humans accused it of being under the spell of the Demon King. He understood their apprehensions, given the inclusion of ogres and goblins in his army, acknowledging their lack of conventional beauty. However, he condemned the killing of his people based on such prejudices, deeming it unacceptable. Then, he announced his commitment to safeguarding his empire, stating that if there were laws permitting murder, he would abolish them and implement new ones in their stead. Riefenhart directed his spell towards the hero Alex Vaughn, and he just swiftly flew away as piece of trash prompting fear among the others. Demon King Riefenhart remarked with a scoff, questioning Alex's proficiency in both swordsmanship and magic, suggesting he hadn't truly mastered either. With a determined expression, Riefenhart reflected that while Alex may be versatile, true strength lies in specialization. He recognized the formidable challenge presented only by Marshal King Teslon, whose renowned strength stood out among the others, making them seem comparatively easier to deal with. As the confrontation intensified, only Teslon, who was known for his strong physique, remained standing ready to face the challenge head-on. He launched himself at Reifenhart with full force. Despite Reifenhart's agile attempts to evade his strikes, he couldn't help but notice Teslon's unwavering determination and focused strategy. Even the castle walls were scattered under Teslon's powerful strikes. Despite Reifenhart's efforts to halt Teslon's relentless assault, the Martial King's attacks persisted from every direction. With determination, Teslon leaped towards Reifenhart, who attempted to block his advance, but appeared visibly distressed. Asserting their imminent victory, Teslin delivered a decisive blow to Riffenhart's head. Blood and tears flowed from Riffenhart's wound as he coughed, remarking that he had blocked the attack with magic. Teslon acknowledged Riffenhart as the leader of the demons, showing respect for his resilience. Riffenhart, resembling a dwarf with blood gushing from his head, inwardly curses his broken spine and imminent demise. Despite his dire situation, he realizes the futility of defeating Teslon. Teslon, emanating energy, declares his intent to pass judgment on Riefenhart, who resigns himself to defeat. Teslon anticipates the liberation of others from demonic influence, prompting Riefenhart to reject the notion of accepting their fate as slaves. Riefenhart realized his defeat, but still he wasn't going to give up. He just couldn't accept that fate of being slave will be the only option for all other worldly races. Fueled by determination, Riefenhart reveals a potent artifact known as the Eye of Time and Space, which he acquired from an ancient ruin. This artifact, possessing formidable magic, remains a mystery even to Riefenhart's advanced magical abilities. Teslon, alarmed by Riefenhart's actions, demands to know his intentions. Riefenhart explained the purpose of the artifact, describing it as the time and space regression spell, capable of turning back time and disrupting divine providence. Despite uncertainty about its effectiveness, he proceeded with the spell, confident that he had nothing to lose. Teslon attempted to intervene by charging towards him, but Riefenhart remained resolute believing that he could not be killed. As Riefenhart initiated the spell, 
the intense light emitted from it overwhelmed both of them. Teslan endeavored to approach within range of the artifact's spell, resulting in a powerful explosion. An energy ball formed and began to expand, emitting a blinding brightness, and everything disappeared. As the light faded away, Reifenhart found himself amidst a forest, nestled inside a cozy wooden house. Feeling the warmth and comfort around him, he began to doubt his own existence, questioning whether he had survived. Slowly opening his eyes, he marveled at the possibility of successfully performing the spell, surprised that he had managed to unravel even a small portion of its complexity. Pondering his circumstances, he acknowledged his intellectual prowess, but remained astonished that his endeavor had borne fruit. Struggling to determine his location, he wondered if he had ever been in such a place before. Lost in contemplation, he grappled with uncertainty about his age and his position in the timeline. Examining his physique, he experiences a wave of disbelief and self-doubt. He questions the unfamiliar scars and excessive muscles, finding them distasteful and unnecessary for someone of his profession as a mage. He reflects, finding it peculiar to discuss his own past allure, yet he recalls with a hint of nostalgia how, in his youth, his charm captivated numerous admirers, leaving many enamored. With age, he evolved into a more refined version of himself, garnering attention and even evoking tears from a few elves along the way. As he gazes into the mirror, he is taken aback by the changes in his facial features, lamenting the loss of his once statuesque appearance. Doubt creeps in as he considers the possibility of his time and space regression spell failing, leading him to inhabit another person's body in the present. Examining the physical features before him, the robust eyebrows, determined eyes, and resolute mouth, his mind begins to wander into the realm of absurd possibilities. With each characteristic he observes, he envisions the outlandish notion that he might be a previous incarnation of the mighty martial king, Teslon. As new Teslon heard his name called out, he turned to see a large man entering the room, commenting on the time and questioning why Teslon was indoors. Feeling uneasy at the sight of the imposing figure, Riefenhart labeled him as a monster. Perplexed by Teslon's reaction, the man expressed confusion and suggested starting the day positively. Riefenhart, still bewildered, asked who the man was, admitting his lack of recognition with fear evident in his voice. The man, slightly annoyed, reminded Teslon of his past use of amnesia as an excuse, indicating it was no longer acceptable. Taking hold of Teslon's head, the man insisted on heading to the training area, leaving Riefenhart puzzled about the sudden mention of training. Observing the situation, Riefenhart recognizes the person before him as Teslon's teacher, the former martial king, renowned as the strongest martial artist across the continents, Gerard Crom Protase. Riefenhart, bound to the trunk of a massive tree, tried to communicate with teacher, but this try was completely failed and he had no idea what is going to happen. However, Gerard swiftly silenced him and proceeded to select a sturdy bamboo staff, indicating the beginning of their training session. Riefenhart, fearful and muffled, watched as Gerard prepared to strike, wondering what a terrible teacher Teslon had. With each blow, Riefenhart felt intense pain, prompting him to question the situation and his own understanding of it. As Gerard continued the rigorous training, Riefenhart couldn't help but fear for his life, his thoughts drifting to a vision of an elf named Cirrus. Meanwhile, Gerard couldn't shake the feeling of unfamiliarity with Teslon's soft hands, wondering if Teslon's amnesia was real. Continuing to deliver blows, Gerard ruminated on the rigorous training regimen of their martial clan Jim Unbreakable, renowned for its simplicity and intensity. Reflecting on his own memory loss in the past, he acknowledged the common occurrence of trainees experiencing short-term memory issues due to the demanding nature of the training. With a knowing smile, Gerard decided that enduring the beating was a simple remedy for Teslon's current predicament. As he intensified the blows, Riefenhart struggled to call for help, silenced by his closed mouth. Gerard persisted in his assault, commenting on humanity's foolish reliance on weapons due to their physical weakness, prompting Riefenhart to question why such reliance was deemed foolish. Gerard's voice boomed as he continued his tirade, addressing Teslon with firm conviction. Dismissing Teslon's protestations as mere excuses, Gerard emphasized the importance of martial artists confronting and overcoming their weaknesses head-on. Despite his fear, Riefenhard couldn't help but find Gerard's logic simplistic and foolish, unlike anything he had encountered before. As Gerard relentlessly beat Teslon, shattering staffs in the process, he compared humans to steel, asserting that the more one endures beatings, the stronger they become, much like the hardening process of steel. Annoyed and confused by Gerard's analogy, Riefenhart couldn't comprehend how people could be compared to steel. Picking up another staff, Gerard proclaimed Teslon to be his chosen student, instilling in him the belief that he possessed boundless potential akin to steel. However, Gerard cautioned that not everyone could achieve such physical prowess, 
likening it to the transformation of high-quality iron into steel, and expressed his faith in Teslon's unique abilities. With each strike of the staff, Gerard imparted his wisdom, drawing parallels between Teslon's inner strength and the vastness of the ocean. Despite Reifenhardt's skepticism, he couldn't help but visualize the vast expanse of the ocean within himself. As the training session came to an end, Gerard instructed our hero to rest. Reifenhardt thanked himself for being so tough. As night fell, Riffenhart found himself submerged in a tub filled with healing potion, its abundance a stark reminder of the luxury afforded to him. Reflecting on the opulence of the medicinal bath, Reifenhart couldn't help but compare it to the tales of queens bathing in milk for radiant skin. Turning to Gerard with curiosity, he questioned the purpose of such a medicinal bath, to which Gerard responded with a simple analogy, likening Teslon's body to steel in need of cooling after intense hammering. Despite the physical toll of the training, Riffenhard found solace in the restorative properties of aura and healing potions, recognizing their role in his rapid recovery and subsequent strengthening of his body. Reflecting on his past encounters with Teslon, Riffenhard speculated on the Martial King's rigorous training regimen, pondering whether Teslon had undergone similar trials from a young age. Submerging himself further into the potion, Riffenhard contemplated the nature of his current reality, pondering the existence of a younger version of himself in this timeline. Wrestling with the possibility of sharing a dimension with another soul, Riefenhart formulated two hypotheses. First, the future Riefenhart and current one, the one inside Teslon's body, coexist with the young Riefenhart. And second, in the young Riefenhart's body is the martial king Teslon's soul. Gerard presented a generous amount of food to our hero, urging him to consume it all to replenish his overworked body. Continuing the workout, Gerard suggested a light jog to aid digestion after the meal. Riefenhart, struggling to keep up, followed Gerard as they jogged on the steep mountain path. Continuing their morning training, Gerard addressed Teslon, inquiring if he was tired or if they should proceed with their morning training. Our hero, with a single finger push-up, indicated his readiness to continue. Later, he performed sit-ups on a sturdy tree branch of a very tall tree, reflecting on the seemingly endless nature of their demanding training routine. Resting with a fatigued expression, his mind raced with introspective thoughts. He pondered the implications of his reincarnation into the past, contemplating the idea of running away and the potential repercussions on the timeline. Concerns about the convergence of past and present selves occupied his thoughts, with a recognition of the inherent uniqueness of each soul and the risks of their interaction. Reflecting on the delayed emergence of teenage Reifenhardt as a mage, he strategized to avoid any chance of encounters, knowing the boy's focus on academic pursuits at the Delphia Magic Tower. Worries surfaced about the possibility of Teslon assuming control of his body, prompting considerations of their divergent strengths and weaknesses. Aware of Teslon's formidable physical prowess honed through Jim Unbreakable, Reifenhart reassured himself of his own advantage, confident that his counterpart would require assistance to master such rigorous training methods. As Teslon dashed through the wilderness, a sense of urgency consumed him. Determined to break free from his perceived prison, he reaffirmed his resolve to escape. His mind was consumed by thoughts of running away and about freedom that he wanted so much. Suddenly, Gerard's voice interrupted his frantic thoughts, startling Reifenhart as he stumbled upon the elder mentor sitting calmly on a stone. Startled by Gerard's sudden appearance, Reifenhart questioned, When did this monster-like old man stealthily approach me? Gerard, seemingly unfazed by his attempt to flee, remarked on the frequency of Teslon's escape attempts, noting the impending milestone of reaching double digits. Reifenhart, taken aback, attempted to assert his true identity as Riffenhart, a mage, only to be met with Gerard's nonchalant response, questioning if this was merely another iteration of Teslon's backstory. Seeing confused Riffenhart, Gerard reminded him of his previous claims of coming from another world, where he allegedly encountered dragons and gods, which left Riffenhart even more astonished. Gerard further recounted Teslon's so-called past life as an active master in the Huan Empire on the eastern continent, known as Murum, hinting at a pattern of backstories. With a firm grip on Riffenhart's head, Gerard acknowledged that his current narrative was more convincing, suggesting progress in his storytelling abilities. Gerard firmly guides him back to his sleeping quarters, despite Reifenhart's inner frustration at his failed attempt to escape. However, he was still determined to succeed, resolves to try escape again the next day, confident that he won't be trapped forever. However, Gerard catches him once more the following day. And once again, even as he tries to get away through underwater, Gerard catches him again and again. Grabbing him by the head, he drags him back, saying, Fret not. If you wait and endure a bit longer, you will be repaid. Despite Riefenhart's initial defiance, he eventually resigns himself to the fact that escaping from Jim Unbreakable, known for its stringent security measures, won't be easy. As time passes, Teslon reflects on his futile attempts to flee, 
realizing the futility of challenging someone as formidable as the martial king, Gerard. Gerard, in turn, highlights the long history of disciples attempting to escape and the futility of such endeavors. Riffenhart contemplates the consequences of attempting to evade capture, acknowledging that even if he were to escape, Gerard's determination would inevitably lead to his recapture. After two years of confinement, Riffenhart finally awakens his dormant aura, breaking free from his chains. This achievement is significant, especially considering his young age. Gerard, witnessing Riffenhart newfound power, expresses his happiness and attributes it to the rigorous training at Gym Unbreakable. Gerard, holding a spiked club, explains that by combining survival instinct with physical training, one's vitality increases. This heightened vitality, in turn, manifests as aura, providing additional power. He then announces that it's time to move on to the next phase of training, leaving Riefenhart excited about what's to come. However, Gerard surprises him by suggesting sparring training with himself, which instills both shock and fear in Riefenhart. For three more years, Riefenhart continued with his training. In the rugged terrain of Vasili Kingdom, amidst the Larched Mountains, standing by the waterfall, he readied himself for another day of practice. With unwavering determination, he focused intensely, employing the Calamity Horn, technique to strike the wall with his fist until it cracked. Amidst his efforts, Riffenhart pondered whether he had reached his limit with the third superposition, or if he could push himself further to achieve greater mastery. The Calamity Horn technique involved focusing all of one's strength into a single powerful blow, resembling a horn when channeling aura. Finally, Riffenhart, facing the destroyed wall, aimed to refine this technique to its fourth superposition. However, he knew that the ultimate stage, the ninth superposition, was capable of devastating even gods. Despite this, both Teslon and Master Gerard had limits to their abilities, with Gerard only mastering up to the eighth superposition, while Teslon had mastered up only to the seventh. Recalling Gerard's advice to reach at least the fourth superposition before descending the mountain, Riefenhart reflected on his former tendencies to seize opportunities to escape even when Gerard was away in the village. Deciding to conclude his stamina training, Teslon attempted a spell called Delphir Lustralum, envisioning it as a bullet made from air to strike his target. Creating a ball of energy between his hands, he launched it towards a tree, calling out the spell name, Arrow Bullet. However, despite his efforts, nothing happened, leaving Teslon frustrated with his body's lack of support. Despite vividly recalling his magical knowledge, he questioned whether his stony body could truly become a mage. Suddenly, Teslon's attention was drawn to a movement nearby, prompting him to turn and observe. To his surprise, he spotted an orc emerging, wielding a sword. As Riffenhart locked eyes with the orc, the creature issued a chilling ultimatum. Human, if you pretend you didn't see me, I'll spare your life. Riffenhart silently assessed the orc before him, estimating his age to be around three or four years old. Wondering if the orc had fled from somewhere like an arena, Riffenhart contemplated his situation. Despite the orc's threat, Riffenhart recognized a sense of pride in the creature's demeanor, suggesting a reluctance towards unnecessary violence among his race. Riefenhart, remaining non-hostile, questioned if someone was pursuing the orc, surprising him with his fluency in their language. Riefenhart explained his ability to communicate as a result of a fateful encounter, leading the orc to acknowledge it as a blessed coincidence. Expressing his willingness to assist, Riefenhart asked if the orc could trust him, prompting the orc to see him as akin to a brother due to their shared understanding of the grace language. The orc perceived Riefenhart's genuine kindness and expressed his concern about the potential danger involved in helping him. Impressed by the orc's articulate speech, Riefenhart pondered whether he came from a noble bloodline. Despite the orc's hesitance, Riefenhart assured him of his ability to provide assistance and proceeded to cast a magical spell to conceal him. Surprised by Riefenhart's magical prowess, the orc questioned if he was a mage, prompting him to ask if it was unusual for him to possess such abilities, while the orc silently doubted Riefenhart's physical form. Gratefully accepting Riefenhart's offer, the orc hid. As he noticed approaching adventurers, one of whom grumbled about the challenges of earning a few silver coins. Approaching Teslon, one man questioned him about a young orc they were searching for. Another man offered a gold coin as incentive. The man expressed skepticism about the offer, suggesting they hear Riffenhart's information first before considering a reward. Riffenhart refused their offer, but one man noticed orc footprints nearby, prompting them to move in that direction. Riffenhart was surprised that his basic magic spell failed to conceal the footprints, realizing its limitations. When Riefenhart asserted that they couldn't enter his dwelling, the adventurers reacted with disbelief, questioning his authority. Noticing Riefenhart's unusual behavior, one of the men remarked on his abnormality. As Riefenhart faced the group of men, one of them attempted to intimidate him by mentioning their large numbers, reassuring him that he shouldn't be afraid. 
Another member of the group commented on Reifenhardt's physique, acknowledging his physical strength but dismissing him as just a child. Recalling the teachings of his mentor, Gerard, Reifenhardt remembered the caution against the potential lethality of his fists and the importance of showing mercy to weaker opponents. Drawing upon his training, Reifenhardt conjured a weapon from a magic circle, intending to demonstrate its effectiveness without causing fatal harm. Despite Jim Unbreakable's emphasis on unarmed combat, Reifenhardt's actions showcased the presence of weapon techniques within their training regimen. As the adventurers challenged Riffenhart and threatened to attack, he confidently wielded the club, smiling as he prepared to engage them. With swift and precise movements, Riefenhardt skillfully subdued his opponents, effortlessly overpowering them with the club. More adversaries joined the fray, but Riefenhardt's mastery of the club arts became evident as he deftly struck each opponent, utilizing techniques designed for rigorous disciple training rather than lethal combat. In a sudden move, one of the men sneaked up behind Reifenhardt and struck him with a sword. To everyone's surprise, including Reifenhardt's, the sword bent upon contact with his body. He found himself questioning the very nature of his own body, wondering if what he possessed was truly human. Reifenhardt maintained control of the situation, utilizing the club's offensive capabilities to incapacitate his opponents without causing fatal injuries. As Reifenhardt continued to strike his adversaries, he reassured himself that his blows wouldn't result in death emphasizing his intention to incapacitate rather than kill. Despite the brutality of his attacks, Reifenhardt's focus remained on ensuring the survival of his opponents, even as bones were shattered and joints broken. With each strike, Reifenhardt remained steadfast in his conviction that his opponents would survive, demonstrating a remarkable level of control and restraint in the midst of combat. Eventually, as the adversaries lay defeated and battered, Reifenhardt turned his attention to the barely standing man, taunting him before commanding the group to leave. Despite their defeat, Reifenhardt allowed the men to depart, demonstrating both his prowess in combat and his capacity for mercy. Grateful for being spared, the men retreated, acknowledging Reifenhardt's superiority in both strength and strategy. Reifenhardt broke the club, signifying the end of the confrontation. He couldn't help but reflect on the recent scuffle with a sense of amusement, finding it enjoyable to overpower his adversaries. However, as he surveyed the broken club in his hand, he began contemplating the idea of taking in disciples and imparting upon them the same rigorous training he had received. Unbeknownst to him, he was subtly being influenced by the philosophy of Jim Unbreakable. Just then, the orc emerged and expressed gratitude towards Riefenhardt, acknowledging him as his savior. The orc pledged to remember this day for the rest of his life and vowed to repay Riefenhardt's kindness. Our hero questioned whether it was appropriate for a warrior to bow so readily, but the orc insisted, explaining the significance of mentors in orc culture and promising to draw a sword for Reifenhardt when the time came. Curious to know Reifenhardt's name, the orc respectfully inquired, prompting Reifenhardt to introduce himself as Teslon. However, after a moment's thought, he decided to use his original name, introducing himself as Reifenhardt Wald and Teres. The orc repeated the name, expressing his intent to remember it. In turn, Reifenhardt asked about the orc's plans for the future and his desired destination in the vast world. The orc explained that while the continent offered ample space, his primary goal was to find a place to rest his weary body. Faced with the prospect of enslavement, the orc expressed a preference for a life of wandering, even if it meant facing death along the way. Reifenhardt directed the orc beyond the Larched Mountains, informing him of a nameless wasteland situated to the southeast, a fortnight's journey away, referred to by his kind as the Land of Trails. Reifenhardt mentioned rumors of orcs living in seclusion there, particularly the elusive Blue Bear tribe. With a nod of understanding, the orc expressed his intention to depart. Before parting ways, Reifenhart inquired about the orc's identity. The orc revealed himself as Tathid, the son of Crota and the heir to Lat's axe. The revelation shocked Riffenhart to his core, realizing that he stood face to face with Tathid, one of the legendary four heavenly kings, renowned for his prowess as a warrior. Reflecting on the unexpected encounter, Riffenhart chuckled at the thought of original Teslon crossing paths with Tathid. Despite his own doubts about original Teslon's willingness to aid an orc, Reifenhardt acknowledged the twist of fate that brought them together once more. As Tathid departed into the distance, Reifenhardt couldn't help but feel intrigued by the whims of destiny. Recalling memories of his empire and the bonds he shared with his four heavenly knights, with a silent vow, Reifenhardt pledged to one day reunite with his comrades, the descendants of valiant warriors, bound by the threads of fate. One day Tathid surely become his friend and brother once again. Half a year had swiftly passed since the strange encounter with Tathid. Amidst the passage of time, Gerard's training regimen continued unabated. With each powerful punch, waves of energy surged forth, prompting Reifenhardt to comment on the overwhelming force. 
As Gerard persisted, Reifenhardt skillfully countered with his spiral guard, earning recognition from his master for its marked improvement. Gerard reminisced about a past incident when Teslon had mistaken himself for Reifenhardt after enduring a severe beating. Reifenhardt, however, questioned why Gerard brought up a memory from six years ago. Gerard reflected on the progress Reifenhardt had made in the ten years under his tutelage, but expressed puzzlement over Reifenhardt's seemingly small stature, his tone laced with curiosity. Our hero, taken aback, defended his stature, citing his height of over 190 centimeters. But Gerard dismissed it as nonsense, asserting that members of the unbreakable gym should be at least two meters tall, citing the stature of past martial kings like Valkenshoot, Calbrain, and Rastel. He then inquired about Reifenhardt's adherence to the breathing technique he had taught him. As Reifenhardt pondered Gerard's words, he recalled encountering a taller version of Teslon around 2.3 meter. Despite Gerard's expectations, Reifenhardt didn't want to grow any taller, fearing the monstrous transformation that would accompany intensified breathing techniques. Gerard acknowledged Reifenhardt's sturdy demeanor despite his small stature. Positioned on the cliff, Gerard instructed his disciple to demonstrate his abilities. Reifenhardt focused his energy, drawing upon his inner reserves as he harnessed the surrounding aura. With a powerful leap, he descended towards the ground, concentrating power in his hand. With a forceful punch, he unleashed the fourth superposition calamity horn, shattering the ground and causing water to surge upward. Gerard's eyes sparkled with admiration as he witnessed Reifenhardt's awe-inspiring demonstration of the fourth superposition calamity horn. Chuckling with genuine delight, he commended Reifenhardt's remarkable prowess and assured him that with such formidable power, he would stand unyielding against any adversary. Meanwhile, deep within Reifenhardt's being, a surge of pride and accomplishment swelled as he realized the magnitude of his achievement in mastering the technique. However, amidst his internal celebration, his reverie was abruptly interrupted by Gerard's unexpected announcement that it was nearly time for him to venture into the outside world. Responding with surprise, Reifenhardt questioned Gerard's statement. Gerard was indifferent to whether Reifenhardt became a force for good or evil. He would live as he desired. This was the price of the training Reifenhardt had endured until then. It reminded him of something his master Rastel had told him 60 years ago. The first piece of advice was that it was fine to accumulate wealth, but one should try not to gain it unjustly. Gerard reminded Reifenhardt of what Rastal had said about becoming a villain. Rastal clarified that he meant if Reifenhardt wanted to go down that path, he should at least be a dignified villain with style. The second advice was to stand by the side of the unjustly treated whenever possible, aiming to live a life praised and respected. Gerard questioned Rastal's mention of the unjustly treated, wondering if that included the weak. Rastal explained that being weak didn't necessarily equate to being unjustly treated, as the world was full of people weaker than Gerard. He asked how Gerard planned to distinguish between the weak and the unjustly treated. The third piece of advice emphasized the importance of continuing the martial legacy of Jim Unbreakable at all costs. Gerard then told Riffenhart to find a disciple to inherit their teachings, asking if he understood. Riffenhart agreed and said he would take that advice to heart. Gerard said that it wasn't easy to find a talented child, so Riffenhart shouldn't dwell on that for his whole life but when such an opportunity came, he shouldn't let it slip away. He then gave Reifenhardt two pouches and told him to take those clothes and the travel expenses. Reifenhardt realized that it was 30 silver. He thought Gerard had great wealth in the Vasili kingdom and also had a mansion in the capital, so he had expected Gerard to spend more. Gerard replied that their martial clan had a set payment for those who descended the mountains, and in the present day, they had raised the fee due to inflation, but in his time, it was around 25 silver. Additionally, Gerard provided Reifenhart with a map, indicating a special gift he had left at the Settelard Mountains as Teslin looked at the map. Reifenhart packed his belongings and departed, pondering the significance of leaving the mountain and whether he truly felt liberated. Suddenly, a powerful beam of yellow energy erupted from Gerard, startling Reifenhart. With unwavering resolve, Gerard encouraged Reifenhart to move forward without hesitation, assuring him of his role as the inheritor of their teachings. Reifenhart ran off galvanized by Gerard's words and the energy emanating from him. In a certain village, the chief bravely confronted a noble, despite being cautioned by nearby villager. The noble inquired about the chief's concerns, prompting him to request payment for the food consumed by the noble and his knights. With disdain evident on his face, the noble regarded the villagers as dishonorable peasants, tossing a coin towards him in a dismissive manner. Observing the chief's shock at the payment, the noble arrogantly assumed it was the villagers' first encounter with such wealth. However, the chief boldly declared the payment to be insufficient, further angering the noble who accused him of insolence and ignorance. Resorting to violence, the noble struck the chief, prompting condemnation from the villagers, 
who now viewed the knights as nothing more than bandits. A voice called out to the noble from behind, inquiring about the commotion. It was Sir Edward, who brushed off the incident as inconsequential when questioned by a young lord named Stefan. Stefan, observing the scene, expressed contempt towards the villagers, labeling them as despicable individuals who warranted no mercy. He justified the nobles' harsh treatment by claiming that peasants lacked an understanding of their societal position and therefore did not deserve leniency. Reifenhardt was puzzled by Elf Cirrus's constant affection, making him wonder why she found his slim body appealing. Cirrus compared his physique to a sharp blade, but Reifenhardt didn't quite see it that way. Our hero, lost in thought, pictured his old self Reifenhardt, feeling emotional as he looked at his reflection now. He saw himself as a powerful stone golem weapon now, feeling sorry for Ceres seeing him like this. However, he also felt a bit proud of his taller stature amidst the sadness, imagining Ceres's reaction. He contemplated the age difference between himself and Ceres, estimating her to be about 17 in human years. Looking out the window, he recognized the city of Krom in the Vasili kingdom. Aware of Cirrus's impending sale at Chatan's slave auction the following year, he pondered his options. He dismissed the idea of destroying the auction site, fearing it would impede his ability to regain his magical powers. Instead, he resolved to address the situation with money, despite his current financial difficulties. Reflecting on the exorbitant prices of elf slaves, he found solace in his powerful body techniques and memories of the future. Recalling memories of an ancient ruin on the way to Chatan, he considered it as a potential solution to his predicament. A young lord in shining silver armor named Stefan turned to Todd, questioning if he had yet discovered the location of the ancient ruins. Todd, a mage, replied with closed eyes, still searching for the elusive site. Observing the landscape, Stefan speculated that they had found the ruins, a notion affirmed by Todd. As he gazed at the mountains, Stephen reminisced about the legendary swordsman buried there, Sir Claude von Leotard's Altion. Meanwhile, Riefenhart reflected on his journey, noting it had been three days since he departed from Krom. Heading north towards the Hatan Mountains along the central road, he marveled at his remarkable stamina and resistance to the cold. Recalling stories of past martial kings braving the winter topless, he dismissed the idea for himself. Pondering his unique abilities, Reifenhart remembered the technique of artificial flashback, allowing him to access memories at will. He recollected encountering Todd, a mage from Delphia's Mage Tower, who had shared information about the ruins with the Altians. Reifenhart had explored those ruins in a previous life, discovering treasures overlooked by Todd's party. Reflecting on the profit he had made by selling those treasures, he imagined the wealth it represented. Upon reaching Cattle Village, Reifenhart surveyed the familiar surroundings from above confirming his memories of the place. A group of villagers gathered, deliberating their next course of action. Concerned voices murmured about the forbidden valley of death, expressing reluctance to venture near it. Despite the danger, they acknowledged the demand for a guide made by nobles, fearing the consequences of refusal. Disdainful remarks were made about the ailing chief because of the demanding nobles. Amidst the discussion, a man named Ted stepped forward, armed with his bow and arrows, volunteering to undertake the journey. The others then turned to Ted, asking if he would join the knights. Ted, feeling confident in his knowledge of the mountains, asserted himself as the best candidate for the task. Despite his own doubts and his wife and daughter silently urged him not to go. However, the villagers continued to persuade him, reminding him of the importance of keeping his word. Ted's reluctance only grew stronger as he witnessed their determination, reinforcing his resolve to avoid the dangerous journey. Suddenly, Riefenhart's voice interrupted from outside, startling the villagers. Ted, alarmed, aimed his arrow at our hero, demanding to know his identity. Riffenhart reassured them, claiming to be a passerby who overheard their conversation. When questioned about his knowledge of the region, Riffenhart confidently asserted his familiarity. Despite the warnings of the valley's notorious dangers, Riffenhart remained steadfast, asserting that he had already journeyed through it once before. In his mind, he considered the villagers should be grateful for his offer, as he believed he was safeguarding their lives by volunteering to lead them. The Valley of Death, often referred to as a dungeon, holds the remnants of the Silver Age, a forgotten era of history. Fifty years ago, a knight named Claude from the Alchins awakened his aura at the age of 45. His daring exploits and heroic deeds became renowned throughout the Vasili Kingdom. However, fame often breeds arrogance, and Claude's pride led him into the Valley of Death with only one servant, where he met his demise. The tragic part was that he took with him the Altian family's prized possession, the demonic sword Altion, which was lost along with him. This sword, 
a symbol of the Altian lineage passed down through generations, became the focus of efforts to recover it for over 50 years. Riffenhart, pondering this history, accompanied Stefan's group. As Stefan led his subordinates towards the Valley of Death, Riffenhart observed Stefan conversing with the elf Lelcia, and he speculated if Stefan could be Claude's grandson. Seeing them talking and smiling, Riffenhart couldn't help but think, with a strangely jealous expression, a slayer elf, they sure are having fun. He noted Sillen as the only saint in the group, wondering if he could use divine spells despite his youthful appearance. Puzzled, Riffenhart questioned how he could be a man. While Sillen and Todd conversed deeply, Riffenhart contemplated joining their conversation. However, he hesitated, noticing their intense discussion. Reflecting on their past interactions, he found the atmosphere strangely pleasant. Yet, he dismissed any suspicions about Todd, confident in his character. Suddenly, a man named Edward praised Riffenhart's decision to guide the group. Our hero modestly responded, downplaying the significance of his choice. Edward explained that the villagers were too scared to take on the task. Riffenhart remarked that it was understandable for the villagers to be scared. Edward, in an arrogant tone, questioned why they would be afraid when the kingdom's brave knights were with them. Angered by Edward's attitude, Riffenhart thought to himself that knights were often filled with self-importance, believing that chivalry turned them into narcissists. Suddenly, a sound caught their attention, and everyone looked around as something shot into the sky from behind the trees. These were no ordinary creatures. They bore menacing features with white fur, bird-like claws, and sharp, vampire-like teeth, their monstrous forms heralding an ambush. Recognizing the threat, they quickly formed a defensive formation. With determination, they braced themselves as the monstrous creatures closed in on them with menacing intent. As the monsters approached them, an elf condemned their attack, declaring humans blessed by a slayer. Stefan ordered the Altion Knight Order to attack, while Mage Todd used fire magic to burn multiple monsters. St. Sillen cast a spell to boost the soldiers' strength and courage. Observing their actions, Riefenhart thought they performed well, particularly Stefan. However, he reminded himself that his perspective was that of a mage, and from a martial artist's viewpoint, their skills were lacking. Riffenhart reflected on Master Gerard's demeanor, acknowledging that his pride likely stemmed from his considerable skill. Despite this, Riffenhart punched the monsters and killed it swiftly, defending the slaves, as no one was paying attention to him. According to Todd's story, Riffenhart couldn't help but ponder the grim possibility that the fate of the guide could have been death. In the chaos caused by the beasts, Stefan, a leader from the respected Altian family, led the group forward. Riefenhart grappled with conflicting thoughts about Stefan's character whether he is good or bad, recognizing his indifference to their surroundings. As the danger escalated, St. Sillen warned Riefenhart to seek refuge behind a tree, prompting him to find some comfort in Sillen's caution. However, as the monsters unleashed their feathered assault on Riefenhart, he initially shrugged off the attacks, only to be jolted by a sudden strike to his eye, prompting a tear after a very long time. In the heat of the battle, Riefenhart's emotions surfaced, reflecting on the tears from his training as he punched the monster. The sight of Riefenhart's ferocity unnerved the slaves, who watched in awe and fear. After defeating the last of the monsters, Stefan immediately turned his attention to the aftermath, requesting a report on casualties and the safety of the mages and priests. Relief flooded the group upon hearing that they were both unharmed. Riefenhart silently questioned his priorities, pondering whether he genuinely cared about the safety of others. Before he could dwell on it further, Stefan's booming voice broke through the jubilation, proudly proclaiming the strength of the Alchin knighthood and urging everyone to enjoy their victory. Despite the outward joy, Riefenhart's doubts continued to nag at him, casting a shadow over the triumphant moment. Meanwhile, Riefenhart took the opportunity to talk with Todd, expressing gratitude for the mage's assistance during the recent ordeal. Todd, however, played down his involvement, considering the incident to be insignificant. Intrigued, Riffenhart mentioned his connection to Delphia's mage tower and brought up his friend. When Todd inquired about the friend's name, our hero mentioned Riffenhart, which sparked Todd's amusement as he puzzled about their relationship. As the conversation continued, Todd's peculiar behavior made our hero uneasy, particularly his fondness for Riffenhart's appearance and personality. He inquired about Riffenhart's well-being, to which Todd replied that he was doing well. Our hero's discomfort grew as Todd shared seemingly harmless details about Riffenhart, leading our hero to question Todd's intentions. Underneath the surface, his frustration had simmered as Todd's fixation on Riffenhart's physical attributes. Caught between disbelief and indignation, Riffenhart had grappled with conflicting impulses, oscillating between the urge to confront Todd and the need to maintain composure. 
Despite Todd's nonchalant responses, protagonist's unease had intensified, fueling his determination to uncover the truth about Reifenhardt's welfare. St. Cillan arrived in Reifenhardt's vicinity, checking on his well-being. Our hero assured him he was unharmed and redirected his attention to the injured orc slaves nearby. St. Cillan proceeded to administer healing to them, despite their protests that they were not in pain. From behind, someone criticized St. Cillan for expending his energy on the orc slaves, likening them to animals. Observing this, Rafenhard couldn't help but notice St. Cillan's kindness, yet felt conflicted as he perceived the treatment of the orcs as dogs and cats, less than human. He pondered the deeper issue of societal values and the challenging journey towards recognizing the rights of all beings. Amidst this, Stefan interrupted, urging Reifenhardt to guide the way forward. Our hero, visibly frustrated, provided directions, advising caution near a nearby stream. Stefan remarked on his strange tone, to which Reifenhardt dismissed it as nothing. Several hours later, a soldier noted the presence of various formidable creatures, a basilisk, a dire wolf, and then over twenty ogres. Another soldier questioned the abundance of monsters in such a small mountain. Internally, Riefenhart reflected on the situation, acknowledging that it was a consequence of deviating from the established path and pressing forward recklessly. When asked if Stefan needed rest, he angrily rallied everyone to continue. As Riefenhart observed the group dynamics, he couldn't help but categorize the different classes. Knights with their haughty demeanor, clerics bound by solemnity, and mages, whom he perceived as narrow-minded and thrifty. Yet, he smirked devilishly, acknowledging his own affinity as a mage to the core. He smirked mischievously, knowing he had indeed chosen the quickest route, though not to deliberately inconvenience others. Meanwhile, Stefan, upon recognizing the location where Sir Claude met his end, expressed astonishment at the density of monsters within the seemingly diminutive mountain. Peering down from above, he marveled, Could it truly be here? Edward, with certainty, affirmed Stefan's observation solidifying their arrival at the ancient ruins of Palton. With anticipation, they advanced toward the ancient ruins. As they neared, the ruins revealed themselves in all their ancient grandeur, commanding reverence and awe from those who stood before them. Todd gestured towards the entrance, confirming its location, while Edward reassured Stefan that it was safe to proceed. Stefan rallied the group, preparing them for entry, but Reifenhart made a decision to remain outside the entrance of the ruins. Stefan, surprised by this choice, questioned Riefenhardt's reasoning, suggesting that his task was complete and he could depart. However, Riefenhardt expressed his dilemma, citing his lack of a means to return to the village alone. Stefan, understanding the predicament, offered assurance, stating that they would ensure Riefenhardt is safety on the journey back as a token of gratitude for his guidance. However, internally, Riefenhardt couldn't help but feel frustrated by this response, questioning why such protection wasn't initially offered without prompting. Stefan emphasized the importance of respecting the wishes of the dormant entity within the ruins. With a unified cry, the group armed themselves and advanced into the depths of the ruins, their mission clear, to locate the legendary demonic sword, Altian. As they disappeared into the darkness, Reifenhart bid them farewell, wishing them luck on their perilous quest. As the group disappeared into the depths of the ruins, Reifenhart seized the moment to focus on his own task at hand. Amidst the eerie silence, he contemplated the history of the ancient ruins of Palton. In its prime during the Silver Age, it functioned as a logistics base, boasting technology that would be considered miraculous by today's standards. Recognizing its inherent value, Riefenhardt prepared himself for what lay ahead. As he ventured further into the ruins, memories flooded his mind. Recalling past expeditions with Ceres, Riefenhardt reminisced about their encounters within the perilous depths. One particular memory stood out, where Cirrus had astutely identified a secret path, earning praise from Riffenhard as he affectionately referred to her as his guiding goddess. The revelation of a hidden door bathed in light was a testament to their combined prowess. Yet amidst these recollections, Riffenhard couldn't help but entertain more adult thoughts, his mind wandering to moments shared with Cirrus in dangerous situations. With a wistful grin, he mused on their bravery in the face of adversity. Returning his focus to the present, Riefenhardt carefully ran his fingers over the weathered carvings on the ancient wall, his mind focused on deciphering the password. Mentally, he sorted through the elements. Libra's left as a base, mixed with aqua and Terra's seal in reverse, right? He muttered, attempting to piece together the puzzle. Despite his initial confidence in having the solution at hand, he soon encountered difficulties. The complexity of the combination, coupled with his limited mana reserves, posed a formidable challenge. 
With growing frustration, Reifenhart realized that the obstacle extended beyond the intricacies of the password, highlighting the shortcomings of his current physical form. As Reifenhart successfully opened the secret gate, he exclaimed in satisfaction, recognizing his achievement. Reluctant to discard his coat, which he had invested ten silver coins in, he put it down and considered his next move. Contemplating whether to test his physical abilities, he stretched his muscles only to be interrupted by strange noises nearby. Confused by the unexpected sound, Reifenhart pondered why screams were emanating from the direction where his knight's group had ventured. His gaze shifted to the stairs leading downwards, prompting a realization. This secret path served as a back door connecting to the third floor of the basement, a realization that dawned on him amidst growing concern. Recalling the military nature of the building and its security measures, Reifenhart understood the gravity of their situation. The activation of the mana system triggered various security features designed to repel intruders. Reflecting on past experiences with Cirrus, he acknowledged their previous freedom to explore without such hindrances. However, with the Altian group now trapped in the basement, Reifenhart is frustration grew as he realized the perilous predicament they faced. The group was shocked when Sir Thomas, one of their members, suddenly died. Stefan couldn't believe it and shouted out his name. He felt really scared and worried about what was happening. As he looked at the sharp weapon, then he saw the face of the scary demon and knew they couldn't win against it. The demon was too strong and big. Stefan wondered how they could fight against something so terrifying. He didn't think they stood a chance against such a powerful enemy. Sillin proceeded to call down the Holy Filaments to shine its healing light on the wounded knights. Everyone was naturally grateful to be healed by such a caring priest. However, Sillin was just doing this so he could survive the accursed dungeon. He had almost died from a collapsing floor earlier, but still had to maintain a cheerful front while thanking the Balchin Mage for the protection magic. After getting everyone relatively healthy to fight again, it was time to go deeper into the strange halls. They had not even gotten too far yet, and the knights were already flying back. The monsters beyond human comprehension had made their way to the position of the main forces. These battle-hardened knights had never seen anything like it before, so their first response was to run for their lives. Sillin was not the type to falter against demons, though. He immediately summoned Philanence's power to strike the corrupt beings down with a mace of light. He immediately followed it up with a spell to grant the human knights unwavering courage to push back. Sillin was quite disappointed with the supposedly courageous knights of Altian when they were just wasting their muscles. Still, he continued to stack buffs after buffs to grant the knights with unwavering bravery. The continuous spells were starting to hijack the minds of the knights. Sillin pumped them up with so much divine power that basically turned the knights into berserkers. It was like a drug side effect. It was time for the buffed knights of Altian to go blade to blade against the demonic army guarding the dungeon. The Balchin mage wasn't going to get upstaged. He was going to contribute through his own spells. He summoned a plethora of iron steel blades out of nowhere that took the demons by surprise. The singular slayer elf that their lord brought was also putting in work by herself. Each strike she brought down to the demons would either kill or bestow some serious damage. Her pristine armor was starting to get soaked by demon blood, and she looked like she was enjoying it. That joy wouldn't last too long, though. She failed to account for a demon coming from an odd angle, sending her to the walls. The internal damage she suffered from a single punch slowly drained her life. The last thing on her mind was whether she was able to help her master. Before passing out, she heard Stefan von Rapanto Altion's resolute voice praising her for sacrificing her body to open an attack opportunity. This young lord was quite good with his sword. Good enough to finish off a demon, at least. That's one of the towering demons down and a few more to go. His men praised him for doing his job living up to his title as the Knight of Resolve against these vile creatures. Stefan took the chance to raise his men's morale with a battlefield speech about how close they were to where even Sir Claude, the Great Knight, was defeated. It could have been a powerful speech to push the men even further, but it was interrupted by a massive explosion in the ceiling. Something had broken through from above and had landed in the middle of their formation. It was a freaking burning demon with the figure of a beast setting everything it touched ablaze. This one was obviously a cut above the demons they'd dealt with earlier. This one could breathe fire to obliterate everything in its path. The demon's raw strength was also a real problem. One swipe of its claws had practically erased the front lines. Stefan continued to try to wake his knights up by trying to appeal to their resolve. The brave knights of Altian took pride in their resolve. But this time was different. Resolve could only take you so far when a flaming demonic beast was rampaging through their ranks. Even Stefan himself wasn't exempt from the heat that the enemy brought. He could only curse at himself. They hadn't even seen the demonic sword and were already on the brink of getting wiped out. The pride that the young lord had as a knight and as a noble was giving him a hard time processing this hopeless situation. He was supposed to be the man who would uphold the name of Altian for years to come. 
He was supposed to be the knight who earned the title of Resolute. With every bit of courage and resolve in his body, Stefan unleashed a shooting strike that pierced through the demon's shoulder. That puny attack with his weak-ass blade just earned him a quick counterpunch straight to the face. The flaming demon was not messing around. You mess with the bull, you better prepare for the horns, the claws, and everything else. Every knight looked at their young lord flying like a ragdoll, and the little hope they still had slowly evaporated. Stefan von Rapanto Altian was now out of commission. Just because the leader was out like a light didn't mean that everyone else should give up. Sillin didn't mind the young brat's fall. He was doing his own thing with his holy spells. The holy light of Philanence was quite effective in dealing with demonic creatures. His spell almost caved the demon's head. It was powerful, but it wasn't powerful enough for a knockout. The only thing that it did was anger the blazing demon and turn its attention to the pretty boy priest. It exploded from where it was standing to get into kill range. Sillin was helplessly frozen in fear. He just closed his eyes and braced himself for the inevitable kiss of death to arrive. But that wasn't going to happen anytime soon now that their inconspicuous guide has appeared to throw hands with some demons. Sillin opened his eyes and could not believe that he was still breathing, unharmed even. All the pretty boy priest saw was the towering burly figure of their guide. His muscles were screaming with strength. Sillin could not take his eyes off this mysterious man that just saved his life from the hands of a demon. Reifenhart stayed in a combat-ready position, but he saw something unexpected as the smoke cleared out. It turned out that it only takes one punch to kill a demon that was practically wiping out an entire army earlier. Riffenhart finally understood why he almost died after taking one punch from Master Teslon in the past. Now that the situation has settled quite a bit, Riefenhart checked on the current status of this small army. Seeing the poor condition of everyone, he decided to move these people to a safe area for now. It looks like that wouldn't be too simple, though. A few undead stragglers were still pouring out of that creepy hall of horrors. Todd and Sillen were both flabbergasted. They couldn't help but question who this martial god was. The first person that Riefenhart prioritized to rescue was the Slayer Elf in critical condition while muscling his way through the Sea of Undead. After a few minutes, the young lord woke up with a severe headache, not knowing what in the world happened after he was knocked out. He was greeted by the sight of fully recovered knights and undead corpses littering the ground. When he asked his officer what happened, the man couldn't quite put it into words either. Upon receiving a detailed account of what happened when everything was practically hopeless, the young lord could not believe what he was hearing. Now he knows that the person they took as a guide was a martial artist in disguise. Stefan went up to Riffenhart with a change of tone and respectfully asked what his name was. He almost revealed his full name, but thankfully stopped himself at Riffen. That Todd fella knows the Riffenhart in the Mage Tower after all. Riffen was quite an unusual name, and based on how strong he was, he should have already made a reputation for himself. When asked what family he belongs to, he casually answered that he doesn't have such a thing. The young lord thought that Riffen would be a noble's child traveling for experience, or something like that. Not a regular person without a background. So the arrogant Stefan tapped Riffen's shoulder, praising him for wrapping up what the knights had pretty much finished. He did an okay job and gave some decent help. Riffen is not one to get punked like that, though. He insulted the young lord's memory for it was this brat that wasn't of much help at all. What followed was the entitled ranting of how Riffen should show respect to the Altian family so Sir Edward had to step in to shut his young master's mouth. He reasoned that a normal person wouldn't know proper noble etiquette, and it was enough to calm the brat down. He proceeded to ask who taught Riffen how to fight like he does. Master Gerard is known worldwide, so Riffen can't drop the old man's name casually, so he just answered that he picked up a few techniques here and there. That doesn't make sense, though. Someone as skilled as Riffen is definitely a pro. Before it gets more complicated, he just changed the topic to the injury management of the knights. Sir Edward noticed that the way Riffen talks so casually feels natural and familiar. It's just that the young man doesn't seem to realize that the way he speaks is full of hubris. He has the cadence that you can only see and hear from a person in high places talking down to their underlings. Riffen doesn't seem to care about anyone's age. He doesn't care about anything. Sir Edward theorized that he must be a royal from another country. He wants to see through that hubris. That way of speech was definitely something odd. Riefen was surveying the grounds when Sillin came up to him to ask how tall he was. When he answered that he hovers around 192 centimeters, Sillin's eyes started sparkling while continuing to ask about his weight. He continued to ask what training Riefen did to have such a magnificent body. His answer was just to get hit, eat, and lift a lot. Sillin Phil Marsis is a priest who's obsessed with martial artists and their bodies. He lost his parents early and was raised in the orphanage, often picked on for being weak and pretty looking. Maybe it was because of this that he started to long for what he did not have. A healthy body and a deep voice. At one point, he even dreamed of becoming a monk who proved their devotion through their body. But the reality was harsh. His height didn't change and puberty never came. 
he also grew his hair really fast. Despite his weak body, he tried weight training, but the only result was an increase in divine power due to using healing spells on himself during training. As such, he started looking up to people with muscular builds. He hasn't seen someone so big and beautiful like Rifen. Young Rifen was starting to get overwhelmed by this guy's gaze. To get out of this interaction, he decided to go ahead and scout the exit, but Sillin wanted to tag along. He admonished the priest for not thinking about the possibility of someone getting injured while the healer wasn't around. Hearing that, Stefan proposed to go with Rifen instead while Slayer Elf Lelchia would stay in this base camp to help out. The young lord asked him if it'd be fine, and Rifen told him to do as he pleased. So, the unlikely duo went ahead to scout for the exit in the halls of the dungeon. Stefan thinks that this country bumpkin should be feeling proud of aiding him, but the fact that he's doing whatever he wants is evidence that Rifen is looking down on the knights. The young lord just wanted a demon to appear so he could showcase his skills and put Rifen in his place. Just as he was praying for a demon to come out soon, he felt his vision turning black. Rifen is almost at his destination, so it's about time for the young lord to take a nap. The undead horde has just arrived in time to get wiped out without the interference of the arrogant young master. These monsters are either hungry for flesh or they just want to kill for the fun of it. They looked fearsome, but each one would burst into mist with just a single punch from Rifen. After taking care of the pesky hindrances, it's time to have a look at the treasures in this area. First up is a room filled with shelves of books and treasures behind a stone gate. Rifen picked up a few 50 loose gold coins from the Silver Age, but his main target should be around the same shelf somewhere. After a few moments of rummaging, he finally found it, the Limitless Bag, a magic tool that stores up to 10 times its normal capacity. There should also be a few more things aside from the bag. There's the Heavenly Brazier, Returning Dagger, Magical Sapphire, and a lot more expensive items. The young lord finally woke up, this time with another headache again. He looked around and asked what happened. Reefen was smiling smugly while explaining to the brat that the undead had come in and hit him in the back of his head. It was a one-hit knockout. Stefan was growing frustrated. Things were going so badly for him today, but he had to be polite and thank Reifen for the assistance. Reifen told him that's not a problem at all. Besides, Stefan would need to take a nap a few more times today. While Reifenhart was cleaning up anything worth taking in this ancient relic site, Stefan had to be knocked out three more times. Even Rifen was starting to worry about the long-term effects of what he was doing on the poor brat. This wasn't supposed to happen to the one titled, The Knight of Resolve. He's starting to think that there's something wrong with his body. On the other hand, Rifen's bag has reached full capacity, so it's time to go back. After heading back to base camp, they fetched the entire army of knights to push deeper into the area. Sillin continued with his fascinating interview, asking Rifen if he's a royal, but he just kept on insisting that he's just a regular citizen. The priest has also noticed his odd way of talking down to people like a monarch would. As a martial artist, Sillin understands that Rifen must be confident, but he even talks down to Sir Edward the officer who is well over 40. Rifen failed to take into account that he's only 22 in this life. His excuse was that he was just not used to meeting new people. The party finally arrived at something that looked promising. A gate glowing with a mysterious light. Stefan took the first step to peer through what this gate was trying to hide. Everyone's mouths hung in shock. Even Rifen felt a little bit of fear crawling down his spine. A demon with morbid marks all over its face was waiting for them in the middle of the room. The head of a goat with multiple sprawling horns and a physique concealing an unfathomable amount of strength. It's the legendary Grail Beast. Rifen did not expect this thing to appear. He doesn't remember seeing a Grail Beast appearing when he explored this site in his previous life. The answer was simple. At this junction in time, the demon has not been taken care of yet. While the battle has yet to start, he spoke up and advised the army to retreat as it'll be hard to take on a Grell Beast with their current force. But a knight happened to notice something about the sword that the Grell Beast was wielding. Stefan looked at the blade with desire and certainty. That's the demonic sword Alchion, the exact thing that they were looking for. Sir Edward was rightfully worried that the young master would get blinded by greed and would force a fight against the demon. He tried to convince the brat that it was too dangerous that they should go back to the family and prepare first now that they know what they're up against. But the brat has made up his mind. He can't bear to see the sword of a great knight at the hands of a dirty beast. Stefan had already steeled his resolve to reclaim that blade, even if it meant facing the Grim Reaper himself. He raised his sword, and his injured knights raised their swords with their lord. Rifen looked at their dumbasses. They don't even know that they're practically marching to certain death. Within the dimensional cracks of these Silver Age ruins, there's a system designed to automatically compensate for the system's weaknesses. That system malfunctioned, causing the supernatural monsters to be absorbed into the defense system. In other words, these demonic beings have become the guardians of the dungeon. They were living freely before being forced into unpaid labor. Moreover, a monster fused into the system becomes much more formidable. 
This should be the same demon that killed Sir Claude the Aura user. A demon ranking higher than Tegril must possess powers from a different dimension. But all the young lord sees is a chained monster, a chained up opponent that they could exploit. Gryphon warned the more reasonable Sir Edward that this small army doesn't stand a chance against that grell beast. But the officer just sees Rifen as a barbarian who knows nothing of honor, that there are things in this world worth risking your life for. For Altian knights, staking their lives in a show of bravery is supposed to be the norm. They couldn't even take down the previous beast, and they were trying to fight something much stronger. Sillin just went with the flow and cast the blessings of Philonance on the charging knights. The knights in the vanguard managed to close the gap and landed a coordinated attack. They didn't even scratch the grell beast's skin, and they paid for it with blood. Griefen already saw this scene coming. He's already warned them that what they have won't work. Knights kept on flying into the air one after another. All of them were beaten up within an inch of their life. No matter what angle they take, the chained grell beast just kept on sending them away. The officers tried to pump their morale up, but it was hopeless. Rifen already knew what type of brat this Stefan was, the kind of brat that wouldn't listen to anyone. At least Sir Edward seems relatively realistic. The young master is actually holding out against the grell beast pretty well. He's flying like a butterfly and stinging like a bee but his bee stings are just making petty scratches. Sillin has been quite diligent with his spells, though. Holy Philonance has brought down its holy mace upon the evil creature. The light of his magic enveloped the beast as it seemed to be affected by the divine spell. He even brought out his best Jojo pose while summoning an apparition to unleash the holy mace of Philonance. Due to his attribute advantage against demonic creatures, his spells packed quite a punch. Next came the slayer elf Lelchia and her trusty blade. She intends to capitalize on the stun effect of the divine spells. She and her master unleashed a coordinated attack that actually managed to cut relatively deep into the monster. Even Rifen had to admit that Lelcia was pretty skilled. She's even better than that veteran Sir Edward. She's the real number two of this group. Just as he was thinking that he might have underestimated this small army, the Balchin mage started priming his blizzard storm spell. It conjured a whirlwind that freezes everything in its path. The system had seemingly sensed that the Grell Beast was in trouble, so it started kicking up the juice to another level. An automatic sequence was triggered transitioning the defense system to phase two as it injected even more power into the Grell Beast. This was what Rifen feared. The increased power of the system was too much for the Knights of Altaian. The Grell Beast was pumped up with so much juice that it was able to break free from being chained up. It used its speed and sheer force to trample over the injured knights mercilessly. With the rate that it was killing people left and right, the small army could be wiped out in just a few moments. But the young master doesn't seem to get it yet. He still thinks that his puny swordsmanship could take the life of a juiced-up grell beast. His pride and arrogance cost him another borderline fatal wound before landing an attack. The chivalry and honor that he kept on peddling were erased in the face of excruciating pain. Sir Edward saw his young master getting trashed and immediately went after his flying body. It looks like Stefan has been injured quite heavily, but he's safe. Lelcia the Slayer Elf immediately went to her master's side to protect him from any more attacks. Maybe with her skill and swordsmanship, she could stand a chance against the fearsome monstrosity. She could practically glide and jump in mid-air with full control of her body. No wonder Rifen acknowledges her skills. But it looks like fancy movement techniques are useless in the face of real indomitable strength as the creature battered her mid-air. She gritted her teeth in pain from the internal injuries that the Grell Beast dished out. And it wasn't done yet. Now that she's a vulnerable target, it's about time to finish the Slayer off with a flaming breath. The demonic creature released an attack that would surely burn down everything in its path. It wasn't just Lelsha who was affected. Every knight in the background also had to run for their life. But for most, that's easier said than done. Their numbers were dwindling, and the Grell Beast was still going on a rampage. The flames even burned through the area near Sillin, putting the priest in harm's way. Its blaze was almost upon him. His eyes lit up with the color of a relentless inferno. Just as he was about to get burnt to a crisp, the muscular frame of Mr. Rifen saved the pretty boy priest from certain death once again. He swiped away the unrelenting blaze like it was nothing at all. As the scattered scorching attack was redirected to the walls, Rifen even apologized for reacting so late. The floor has been cleared of any wandering knights. It's time for Refn to take over the reins of this battle. With his current power, he was still skeptical whether he could solo something as powerful as this juiced-up grell beast. If he's being completely honest, he's been curious about just what the limits of his full power right now are. He wanted to know if the martial ability of his current body could handle that demon. Back when he was a mage, he would have never gambled when there was no chance of winning. But it's different now. He has become a warrior. He can now feel the thrill of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a strong opponent. A sensation that he could have never experienced in his past life. He has truly come a long way as a martial warrior. Master Gerard would be proud. That old man always told him that when in doubt, strike first.
That's exactly why he opened up with two piercing key bullets. Grillbeast tried to counterattack out of frustration, but Riffin easily dodged with a lean back. His body could deflect a steel sword, but the demonic sword that this monster was wielding could leave a scratch. He also failed to take the unpredictability of this demon's movements. Riffin was caught off guard, and that gave the enemy the opportunity to land another attack. He managed to block the incoming attack with his arms, but the force behind it was way too strong, sending him away. Sillin watched the whole sequence, including the part where Riffin smashed against the wall, destroying it completely. But there's nothing to worry about. With Riffin's aura activated, this kind of roughing up wasn't too big of a problem. The pretty boy priest was speechless. This is his first time seeing an aura user in action. Riffin was just thinking about how if he stood his ground, he could have had the chance to counterattack. But after sparring with his master for years, parrying attacks has become a habit. That's just a sign that his techniques need a little more refinement. The Grail Beast roared at him using demonic language. Riffin doesn't understand, but he's willing to go for another round of combat. A demonic beast and a martial warrior exchanged blow after blow. Both were not willing to give space for one another. The young lord was finally seeing how true powerhouses collide. He couldn't even fathom how a country bumpkin was using aura. A lowborn with no honor and family was wielding aura. Something that a noble among nobles like Stefan hasn't manifested yet. And Riffin was using it so effortlessly. The bratty young lord was starting to feel his view of the world crumble. He couldn't take his eyes away from such a glorious display of technique and power. A monster that has nearly wiped out his army is roaring in pain from being pushed back by this mysterious man. The frightening question in Stefan's mind was who on earth was this guy, and where the hell did he come from? He refused to believe that this was an ordinary citizen. That Riffin guy is nothing short of a monster. Grillbeast tried to strike our hero with his sword in a rage, but he was able to dodge it without any problems. During the battle with the monster, Riffin could feel how incredible were the things he had learned about during this time. Right now, he could easily see all of Grellbeast's stupid attacks. In the very next instant, he had already dealt a crushing blow to the monster. His attack was far beyond what the knights present here could do, who couldn't even scratch this creature. However, it wasn't that simple with this monster. Guardians of the Ruins don't die even after being seriously wounded. The reason for this is quite simple. The Ruins provide mana that helps heal their wounds. Simply put, inside the ruins, they were very strong, and if of high level, they were almost invincible. After a couple of moments, Grillbeast had already recovered and was ready to continue fighting with even more fury. He concentrated an incredible amount of energy in his mouth, and then he immediately attacked. But our hero was able to dodge this attack as well. Taking advantage of the fact that the monster still hadn't recovered from the attack, he grabbed its arm. This technique was called Joint Lock Practice. It was followed by an air battle practice that went straight for the creature's jaw. But even that wasn't the end. Strike technique practice, that was really exciting. And Riffin was truly happy. For the first time in a long time, he could freely try out his powers without the risk of being killed to death by his teacher. However, even this opponent was still only a sandbag to him. At the same time, the other surviving knights were watching this epic battle with shock. It was unbelievable that a human was able to stand alone against such a terrifying monster. Our hero had no more time to play with Grillbeast, but if he wanted to end things quickly, he would have to use the Horn of Calamity to do so. The problem was that if he used it, the place would surely collapse and everyone here would be buried alive. The extra baggage was really annoying. As he continued to ponder what he was supposed to do, Todd called out to him. He suggested him to swing his sword. According to him, he could defeat the monster if a divine spell worked on the aura-covered sword. Riffin was well aware of this himself. He answered him that he didn't know how to cover his weapon with aura, but Todd didn't seem to hear his answer and asked him what he was talking about. Our hero irritatedly said that he only knew how to use the aura on his own body. Todd couldn't believe it. However, it wasn't the Riffin's fault. The problem was that this was his martial art. But suddenly, our hero was called out by Sillen. It seemed like he was up to something. He decided to check with Riffin to see if his body really had high strength. While continuing to fight Grillbeast at the same time, our hero replied that it was. His answer satisfied Sillen quite well. The very next moment, he began to cast some kind of spell. As soon as he finished, he directed it at Riffin, and as it turned out, it was really effective. Our hero almost immediately felt an unprecedented surge of strength. It felt like he was capable of literally anything. Grabbing the unsuspecting Grell Beast by the arms, he threw him over himself and slammed him against the wall with all his might. As soon as he came to his senses, he couldn't help but notice that the guy's divine spells were truly amazing. He was able to cast a enhancement spell that would normally be cast on a weapon, on another person's body. It was truly amazing. Seeing the success, Sillen smiled brightly and said that now they should beat that damn demon to death. 
Riefen was a bit shocked at the contrast of someone so beautiful having such a crazy personality. However, there was no time to think about that at all. As long as the holy spell was in effect, he had to finish off the monster. In an instant, he was in front of Grail Beast and struck it using Divian Kick. This was followed by a divine knee. In short, Riefen mercilessly continued to beat up the monster. But these were no longer the same punches as before. Enhanced by the divine spell, they carried a monstrous destructive power. At the end of it all was the divine punch. It was the final surprise that our hero had prepared for Grail Beast. A purple beam of light pierced through the monster. In an instant, the monster was torn in half. This was an unconditional victory. Such a heroic posture couldn't leave Sillen indifferent. The mana channels that were connected to Grail Beast began to disappear. It looked like it was over, and they had won. But Reefen was still wanted to fight. His fighting spirit was stronger than ever. The wounded Stefan came up to him, and you could easily tell from his irritated face that he wasn't happy. He began to angrily ask what had amused our hero so much, and why he had been playing dumb and hiding his identity until now. He admitted that he was stronger, but he couldn't forgive that he had trampled his knightly honor. Stefan said that it must have been fun for him to stand by and watch them suffer. Rifen replied that he had never mocked them. You could mock someone if you were interested in it. But our hero didn't understand how he could mock if he didn't care at all. Deciding to just ignore the guy, Rifen turned around and started to walk away. Such behavior infuriated Stefan. He immediately rushed at our hero with his sword, furiously asking how he dared to turn his back on him. However, his sword did not reach its target, because Rifen suddenly bent down to pick up the demon sword, which was the goal of the mission. Stefan did not expect to miss at all. When he couldn't stay on his feet, he began to clumsily roll down the slope. He was so stupid that even afterwards he blamed our hero, asking him how he dared to dodge his blow. But despite his insolence, Riefen did not respond in kind. Holding out the sword to Stefan, he again said that he had never thought of mocking him. Besides, wasn't this sword what all the fuss was about? Sir Edward was impressed by such a noble act on the part of our hero. The lack of greed in the presence of something so valuable, that was the real strength in his opinion. Stefan got what he wanted, but he wasn't happy about it. He realized that he had been humiliated, and he couldn't accept it. As for Riefen and why he didn't take his sword, the real reason was that it was only a second-class weapon compared to what he had in his previous life. So the mission was accomplished, and they got what they wanted, our hero offered to go back. Everyone eagerly supported this proposal, while the angry Stefan continued to hold his precious weapon, which could not make up for his trampled pride. The road back passed without incident, and they managed to make their way back to the village of cattle. Upon their return, Sillen healed several of the villagers. Watching him also hand out gold coins to the villagers, Rifen noted that he knew how to do business. For such a small price, raising the villagers' trust in the Philanent's holy order was clearly a great idea. Since the mission was accomplished, Stefan's troop of knights didn't linger and soon left the village. On the way, Stefan told Sir Edward that they needed to investigate that young man named Rifen. He readily agreed adding that he too had noticed that he was very talented. After hearing this, Stefan's face became irritated. There was no way he was going to admit that he was weaker than that insolent guy. Rifen didn't linger either and set off on his way. Thanks to going to the dungeon, he was able to try out his skills, as well as obtain gold and artifacts. Now, it was also the right time to meet Ceres. However, he wasn't destined to travel alone. Our hero asked Sillen, who was following him, why he was following him. In response, he asked if Rifen knew about the priests who traveled around the world, showed the grace of the goddess, and cared for the faithful. Our hero nodded affirmatively. He knew they were called pilgrims. They were also known for writing while traveling. Sillen said that he had originally planned to return to the Holy Order, but changed his mind and decided not to miss the opportunity to become a pilgrim, all because he had the opportunity to travel with the strongest man he had ever met. Our hero was frightened by the fact that he looked at him with the look he had seen in Todd's eyes. He felt as if he had been cursed, for there was no other way to explain the large number of perverts he had encountered. But even though Sillen was strange, he was not a bad person. At first, our hero thought of just politely refusing him. However, since he was a very capable cleric, he decided that he could use him as the best first aid kit. As the owner of such a strong body, he would hardly need help. But anything could happen to Cirrus. Having made up his mind, he told Sillen to decide whether to follow him or not. On the way, Riefen would not be bored, because Sillen asked him questions. He was very interested in how our hero was able to gain so much weight and what exercises he did for this. In the end, our hero even thought about whether he really did the right thing by taking him with him. While our heroes were on their way, the following events unfolded in one of the estates of the city they were traveling to. All around the manor were heard someone's angry scream. The owner of the manor was asking his subordinates why they had done so badly in the training. 
the man who was responsible began to apologize, saying he had done his best. However, Karen Trade Union's heir Beret didn't care about that. He believed that elves were supposed to be loving to their owners and offer them their bodies and minds. He said with irritation that he knew she was too cheap for a slayer. However, he didn't understand why such a cheap elven woman was so arrogant. The blonde-haired elven sitting on the bed replied that she was born like this. But Karen was not only annoyed by that, he couldn't stand her annoying stare. Then again, the elven girl couldn't help it either. She was born with those eyes. Still, the bastard didn't care at all. He immediately shouted to the butler to bring her back and buy a normal elven girl, not a low-grade product like this one. In the Chiton Principality's deep-rooted and traditional elf slave market, Elfenheim, the elven girl known as number 148, was returned for the third time. Chiton Principality was a commerce nation located at the northernmost point of the continent, near the towering cold mountains. It bordered several other nations. It was a place where trade flourished, thanks to the Duran River cutting across its perimeter. Cutting across the Chatan trade route, Riefenart finally arrived at Zeppelin, the capital of this nation and the center of all commerce. It was a bustling commercial city teeming with prosperity. The place was just as Sillen expected from the best city on the continent for businesses. This nation had been established by merchants who bought land from the Graham Kingdom, after all. A nation where merchants lived like kings and people were driven by money. It was also the place where Cirrus currently resided. The pretty priest was really having trouble following Rafen's long strides. Off to the side, they happened to see something interesting. An old, decrepit man was begging to be spared by a fat man with lavish clothes. This fatty was Rolofane Trade Union's head, Tarek, and he did not take too kindly to people who insulted his organization. For that reason, he decided to beat the poor beggar as a so-called lesson. After venting his anger through 30 hits, he followed the beating by tossing 30 gold coins as tactless compensation. Sillin immediately ran to the old man's side to make sure that his bleeding head was all right. The pretty priest was disturbed and wanted to report the incident to the authorities, but the beggar stopped him. To this old man, being beaten up for 30 coins was worth it. This could help him set up his place in the city. Sillin found it ridiculous that a victim would just act like nothing happened if they were paid. Riefen wasn't surprised. People in this place were driven by money. The priest thought that he had seen it all with his travels. But this was new. In Zeppelin, the punishment for law-breaking was just a fine. There was no need to go to jail if you had cash. Now Sillin was getting worried about what business Riefen had in a depraved town like this. He wanted to answer honestly but stopped himself midway through. He finally realized how he would sound, but he had to confess that he came to this place to buy an elf. Sillin took it the wrong way and judged Riefen for being a certain type of depraved person, an allegation that Riefen strongly denied. But since he couldn't explain his previous life, he just had to accept the priest's judging looks. Sillin admonished him for being a man. Riefen reminded him that he was one too. To that, Sillin had no retort. Tarek's residence was situated in the priciest part of the merchant town. He was currently cursing other merchants for accusing his Rolofane trade union of ripping them off when they should be working harder instead. A beautiful elf was by his side to pacify and agree to anything. There were actually multiple slave elves servicing the disgusting fatty at the moment. That's when he spotted his old friend, Beret. The fat bastard asked the piece of crap what happened to the slayer he bought recently. Barrett answered that he couldn't make the Slayer listen, so she returned about two weeks ago. Tarek was quite amused that this guy couldn't even domesticate an elf slave. He thought it was emblematic of why Beret's Karen Trade Union couldn't get into the top ten. Beret tried to justify that there were a lot of people who returned the defective slave too, and that's why she was so cheap. The fat bastard was already thinking about what face this Beret would make if he managed to tame the untamable elf and decided to get to Elfenheim later. In the center of Zeppelin, the Rifen and Sillen duo decided to stay at a massive inn. When Riefen entered the room, he saw something extremely odd. Sillen was trying and struggling to work out. His skinny frame was in full display. If he tried this hard regularly, it didn't make sense that he still had no muscle mass. Riefen warned the priest not to push too hard if he didn't want to get muscle aches. But for Sillen, that wouldn't be a problem at all. After heavy workouts like today, Sillen liked taking the easy route of just healing himself back to full. From a sweaty mess, he went back to being a refreshed pretty boy in just a few seconds. Riefen finally understood why this kid worked so hard without even gaining any muscle. Healing magic was similar to a spell that turned back time. Muscles were supposed to be trained by stretching, destroying, and regenerating them. Using a heal spell would just take him back to the state before he began exerting himself. So, this foolish pretty priest had been wasting his time. Seeing the look on his face, Sillen asked if something was wrong. Riefen just decided to teach him a more effective training method later. He also asked if the long hair became annoying when Sillen worked out. 
But even if the priest cut it, it just grew back really fast, and there was a belief that hair grew fast the more you thought of lewd thoughts. Anyway, Rifen had enough money now after trading the treasures from before. It was about time to hit the slave auction, so Sillin also grabbed his garb to tag along. Various kinds of slaves were sold at this auction. The most popular ones were naturally the elves. They had a higher value than orcs, dwarves, or any other races because of their unparalleled beauty. That fact also inflated their prices, making them much more expensive than other slaves. A slayer went for around 800 gold coins. A female elf could fetch 300 gold coins, a young female elf for 100, and a young male elf for 30. A competent orc swordsman went for 10 gold coins, orc slaves were worth 5, and baby orcs fetched about the same. Male elves had no demand because of their sky-high suicide rate. Another reason for the popularity of elves was their long lifespans, but that also meant that they stayed in the adolescent stages much longer. There was a famous joke that a foolish merchant would die of old age investing in a baby elf. Even Sillen had heard of Elfenheim, an elf-specialized slave auction with 300 years of history. Reifen didn't like this place at all. Naming a slave auction Elfenheim after the paradise of elves was sickening. Sillen had never been to a place like this, and he was glad to see that the elves were being treated better than orcs. But they were still slaves. Reifen asked him if slaves could be happy. The innocent priest was confused by that inquiry since these creatures used to live in the wilderness. He thought that they should be happier under the care of humans where they wouldn't have to worry about starving to death or anything. Reifen was quite used to this kind of response. This was what the average human thought of this inhumane situation. He knew that people's mindsets could not be changed by force. Doing that would only bring fear. That's why he intended to build a different kind of empire this time around. Different from the one that he had established in his past life. Rifen could not construct a dark empire of a demon king. What they needed was a proper nation of the otherworldly species. The attendant apologized for making them wait and finally arrived to show them the goods. Beautiful elves stormed into the room with each of their unique charms. These were the prided slayers of Elfenheim. Sillen, being a man of God, quickly covered his eyes from sinning. The attendant thought that he was a modest young lady. Rifen was appalled. For the forest fairies, descendants of the Great Spirit, to be in this position was unacceptable. He asked the attendant for a slayer with darker skin. Both the attendant and Sillen looked at him differently for having a so-called unique taste. The pretty priest even admonished him for going all through that slavery is bad lecture only to ask for a special request. The sleazy attendant confirmed that they had one slayer that fit the description, but he was hesitant to show her to Rifen. In the end, they had to exit the main lobby and walk deeper into the facilities. There were elves outside in the sun practicing their mandated exercise. Elfenheim had their specialized method to make sure that they had top-quality merchandise. They even fed these girls fresh vegetables, fruits, and nuts. Elves raised on high-quality food emitted a pleasant smell. There were many cases of malnourished elves, but Elfenheim prided themselves on not having that issue. Hearing all that sick drivel just angered Rifen. <laughs> he asserted to just be taken to the elf. <laughs> the attendant felt a crushing pressure for a moment, fearing the burly young man. They went to a gated part of the establishment to see number 148. In this room were the Slayer candidates who had yet to grow fully. This was a place where they honed their skills. The dark-skinned elf that Rifen was looking for was just over there in the middle of the chaotic training ground. Laying eyes on the love of his life in such a state brought tears to the previous Demon King's eyes. Her grit and determination were still unwavering in battle. Even with tattered clothes, small wounds, and scratches all over her body, Rifen was still smitten by her regal beauty. It was her. It was Cirrus. After a long journey to Zeppelin, he could finally reunite with his partner. Seeing her again brought Riefen back to the memories of his past lives spent in their laboratory. The beautiful Ceres was always by his side to reel him in when he went a little crazy with his wild experiments. But even if he failed and destroyed the whole lab by mixing a fire plant with a seed rock, Cirrus never got mad. She just apologized for going a little overboard, even though she made the same excuse the previous times. Ceres just couldn't stay annoyed at him for too long. She found him too cute, even in his old age. She would always be there to clean him up and help him stand again. With all the years they'd spent together, Cirrus still insisted on calling him Sir Reifenhart instead of addressing him casually. That was one thing that Cirrus couldn't do. When asked why, she would just respond with a meaningful smile. Before they knew it, the kingdom they built was already on the brink of destruction. Riffenhart looked at Antares burning to the ground with a somber expression. Riffenhart's four heavenly kings kneeled before him, awaiting their instructions on how to deal with this situation. The orc chieftain Tathid broke the silence to give his final regards to his lord. Athilka, Machaline, and Cirrus stayed silent, however. 
Rifen teased that they looked like this was their first time seeing someone on the verge of death. The whole continent had gathered troops totaling two million to take down the Demon King, the nemesis of humanity. This was humanity in full force. Emperor Riefenhart Valden Terras couldn't help but wonder why humans were planning to ruin their countries just for one battle. They were so blinded that they could not accept the independence of other races. Tathid tried to plead for his lord to join them in escaping, but they could only get to safety if Riefen held the fort. He apologized to the god of dwarves, Alpoth, for still ending up in this position with a godly guarantee. But Machelin insisted that he shouldn't. The dwarven oracle foretold Reifenhart's arrival with an elf and orc by his side on the way to the abyss of Daiman. He was supposed to be the one to tear down the pillar of Hockrell, the person who would bestow the dwarf's salvation. Reifenhart still couldn't believe that the dwarves had taken him as their savior back then. The old dwarf still believed that with Alpoth's blessing, all of them would reunite again. But for now, it was time to say farewell to each other. Once everyone finally took their leave to escape the incoming human army, Cirrus stayed behind. She insisted that she would be waiting for Sir Reifenhart. Reifen asserted that fate was something unknowable, so if something were to happen to him, he hoped that Cirrus could find someone nice. He tried to convince her that the situation was hopeless, but she strongly swore that she would be waiting for him no matter what. For a moment, the two exchanged meaningful glances. They had shared mutual love for all the years they'd been together, and there was nothing that could break that. Above the fire of the burning Antares Empire, the Demon King and the love of his life shared one final kiss before tragedy struck. Riefenhart snapped back into reality with the attendant explaining that he felt bad showing this elf to customers because she was defective and uneducated. She might have the skills, but her personality was irredeemable. She was inferior to the other slayers. It was becoming so hard to sell her off that they were just using her to train other elves. In here, elves in training could get a taste of cutting into living flesh through Ceres. Despite disclosing all those details, Rifen still wanted to go through the transaction. Seeing Rifen as a wealthy pervert, the attendant reckoned that he could get away with adding another hundred gold coins to the price tag. This brought the price up to three hundred gold coins for a defective product. As far as Sillen was aware, that was an extremely good price. The attendant was still not sure if he should even sell something so trash. But Rifen went ahead with the purchase, and the first words out of the elf's mouth were a question asking him if he was her new owner. Upon inspection, he saw all the scars on her body and felt bad for everything she had gone through. The attendant offered to have a priest take care of the wounds, but that much could be left up to Sillen. It was cold outside, so they should get something for her to wear first. For now, she could just take his jacket. Since she didn't have a name yet, Riffin proposed that she should take the name Cirrus. When asked if she liked it, she just answered that she memorized the name now. From now on, her full name will be Ceres Belencia. But slaves had no need for surnames, so she asked if Balencia was her master's surname. It wasn't. This was a surname that she would hold on to from now on. He properly introduced himself as Riffenhart, and the pretty boy was Sillen, a priest of Philonence. Ceres remained wary, but she committed their names and faces to her memory. After they left, the attendant in Elfenheim was faced with a problem regarding number 148. The greedy Tarek could not believe what he was hearing. The slave he had taken an interest in had already been sold just an hour ago. His initial thought was that bastard Beret realized his plan and bought the slave back. But the attendant explained that the customer was a young man new to this town. He didn't even get a name since the guy paid in full cash, so probing wasn't necessary. Even with so many merchants, there was almost no one who would carry enough money to buy a slayer. But the price wasn't that high in the first place. Hearing this, Tariq inquired about what this guy looked like. The attendant truthfully described a young man with a burly build, someone who stood out. Currently, that young man was on a shopping run to get Cirrus out of her tattered slave clothing into something more practical. She looked quite cute with adventurer equipment on. Even Sillen was amazed by Cirrus's beauty. They could go with this outfit for now, they could always make an upgrade later. Rifen asked Cirrus if she was hungry, but she kept on responding like a slave willing to do her master's bidding. He tried to explain that she didn't have to think of him as a master, so she thought she was getting returned to the auction again. He stumbled on his words, afraid to say the wrong things. Cirrus couldn't quite understand what he was doing. She thought that this generous act and fancy clothes were just a front. This man was treating her as if she were a human girl or something. Rifen told her that it'd be good if they could treat each other as comrades traveling together. She could drop calling him master and just call him by name. Ceres grew cold. She thought that this was some type of role play, that Rifen was just a pervert who was playing the role of an adventurer, a foolish man who wanted to act as the hero who traveled with a beautiful swordsman. But she didn't voice these suspicions out and agreed to call him Sir Reifenhart. She had grown up with the idea that all humans were the same, 
Still, that did not stop her from hastily devouring some good food in front of her. People said that Redanti's Grace was the most famous restaurant in Zeppelin. By using the name of the goddess Redanti, the god of earth and bountiful harvests, the provider of food, one might say that the establishment was a form of worship. Selin argued that if the restaurant was providing food as an act of worship, then the food should be free. That was rich coming from a Philanence priest making money using the beauty business. Pretty Boy Priest insisted that there was nothing wrong with what they did. Using beauty and love didn't go against their religion. Rifen brought up the fact that they charged quite a hefty sum of gold for the service, and Sillen couldn't cook up a response. After a moment of silence, Rifen turned towards Cirrus, who was hungrily devouring her meal. After a while, she finally noticed her master watching her eat without holding back. She was reminded that all humans were the same, and she shouldn't be too comfortable. But seeing her go back into her shell concerned Rifen that she might not like this place. He used to bring her here to commemorate their first meeting anniversary back then. He was well aware that he met Cirrus as a savior back then, and now he was meeting her as a buyer. It may be a meeting nonetheless, but the meaning behind it was different as day and night. He was starting to worry that he might have forced their meeting too soon. But Reefen was certain that she'd accept the things he would say to her sooner or later, so he was satisfied to just have her by his side. The next stop was the armory where the best weapons in the city could be bought. He was confused to see Cirrus pick up a rapier when she usually used a scimitar. That was a slip-up. He wasn't supposed to know that fact. Thankfully, Sillen butted in complimenting Rifen for being a martial master who could tell what weapon a person used just by looking at their hands. They left the armory with Cirrus equipped with a mithril-based weapon that she had always longed to carry. Sillen also ended up buying a knife when he had no use for it as a priest. As they were walking back to their accommodation, Rifen noticed some trouble brewing. A group of uniformed men were seemingly waiting for them to pass through a narrow alleyway. The man leading the charge opened his mouth with a polite proposal to talk about something. They hadn't exchanged any other words yet, but Rifen already knew that this situation might erupt at any second. Rifen asked the strangers what the matter was, showing little enthusiasm for the situation. The man in front stated that an individual of noble status had set his eyes on the female elf that Rifen had just bought. Ceres watched and listened without even batting an eye. Confirming his suspicion that this could turn ugly quickly, Rifen leaned toward the man and asked, What now? The man wanted Rifen to sell Cirrus to them. The uniformed group promised that they would purchase her at a reasonable price. If Rifen would like, it would even be possible to trade her for a proper slayer indicated in a bill of exchange. Rifen quickly answered that he was not interested while the man maintained a calm demeanor after hearing his refusal. He just reiterated that they would pay a reasonable price a phrase that would make any other person in this money-driven city feel like they just hit the jackpot. Rifen was slowly running out of patience for this badgering when he had already said that he was not interested. The man and his uniformed group shot him sharp glances, insisting that he left them no choice. But they just walked the other way, not causing any trouble at all. At least not now. Back in Tarek's lavish residence. The greedy Tarek was yelling at the man named Romad for returning empty-handed when he wanted to get his hands on that elf. Romad explained that Rifen wasn't budging no matter the price and with so many eyes watching them in the city, beating him up and tossing some coin after would not be a good idea. He would just look for the chance to abduct the slayer and fabricate a lie that she died and offer to pay twice her price. Romad thought that this was the cheapest way to get what the boss wanted. Tarek was quite pleased with the plan, but wanted Sir Lantas to tag along. That old bat had just been sitting around and getting paid. It was about time to work, in the three-person party's accommodation. Rifen was looking at his remaining funds stored in the unlimited bag. He thought he would have 2,000 gold in surplus, but he had a lot more than that. Still, this was just a drop in the ocean since he was planning to rebuild an empire. Maybe he should start investing rather than lugging these heavy coins around everywhere. Come to think of it, the famine struck the Crovens' kingdom, a neighboring territory around this time back in his previous life. The Crovens' kingdom was an agricultural country. Their fertile land and abundant harvests were blessed by goddess Redanti. They never considered preparing for a famine, However, when spring comes, a surge of starvation deaths and the hellish scenes of parents eating their own children will unfold. So, it would be wise to invest in grains starting now. The trade unions that could make that happen are Rolofane, Karen, and Tauban. First of all, Rolofane is a hard pass. Their leader was a pervert who abused Cyrus in the previous timeline. Between the other two trade unions, Reefen decided to go with the third largest one on the continent, which specialized in grains, the Tauban Trade Union. The leader of said union is Sivolt Tauban. He's currently in deep trouble as Rolofane was doing their best to bury them using unethical ways. At this rate, Tauban will lose its trade partners. While he was stressing over funds, one of his employees notified him that a possible investor had come. 
but a petty amount of investment won't solve their problems. It'll just increase their workload, so his first instinct was to send the investor away, until his employee told him that the guy offered an influx of 1,500 gold coins. Reefen entered the office with a big smile while telling the union leader that he wanted 1,500 gold coins invested in grains. He wanted the money to flow into the Crovance kingdom around the time of barley harvest next spring. Sivolt Tauban immediately advised against such a move. Since selling grains to Crovan's kingdom is like selling soap to the orcs, they won't buy it. But Rifen was already all in. If this doesn't work out, he'll take the loss while Tauban will still pocket the benefits if it turns out well. But Tauban can't possibly screw a customer making an investment bound to fail. If Sivolt won't do it, Rifen threatens to just go to a different union with his money. The honorable leader honestly confessed that his union was not in a great situation. With Rifen's investment, they could overcome the challenge and prosper. He wanted his clients to prosper too. This man was adamant in his previous life too. But this is Reifen's money, and he could do with it as he pleases. Now he needs that contract and fast. But before all that, there is one promise that Sivolt must abide by. That is to not spend his funds on personal use. He doesn't even need to say what would happen if that promise were broken. One more thing. There should be a Tauban trade union branch in Graham Kingdom since they recently paved a road in the northern region. Rifen wanted to know if they also have a branch near Delphia's Mage Tower. They don't, but they have a route running through it. He wanted the union to investigate someone from that tower. This is an opportunity to get information regarding the Riffen heart of this timeline. Meanwhile, Sillin and Cirrus were getting acquainted in the courtyard of the inn. The beautiful elf wanted to take this time to sharpen her skills with Sillin's tiny blade. Pretty Boy Priest watched in awe as Cirrus performed a series of moves flowing like water from one slash to the next. She truly looked like a dignified warrior whenever a blade was placed in her hands. Training her combat arts reminded her of her mother reminding her that as high elves, they are the original guardians of the forest. All elves lived in eternal happiness under the World Tree's protection in Elfenheim. They lived among animals, and the trees provided endless nourishment, though they are currently under siege by human forces. Her mother believes that Eldia will lead them back to paradise once again. They were supposed to be the descendants of the Great Fairy, yet their territory was burnt to the ground. Cirrus recalls her mother's voice telling her not to forget their pride. Those words echoed in her mind as the flames of destruction were reflected in her eyes. The next thing she knew, she was being sold away to a good place because of her pretty face. From now on, she must become loyal and polite as a good elf. But her first owner was a piece of garbage that beat up slaves every chance he got. Ceres wasn't even treated as a slave. She was like a prisoner, not even given food to sate her hunger. The other elves sneered at her. The fact that she was a pure-blooded high elf became something to be ridiculed by her fellow elves. What became her salvation was the sword. All the adults from her fallen kingdom wielded swords. They fought bravely and died with dignity. That's why she liked the sword. Through the swing of the blade, she could recall the proud figures of her parents' fighting enemies. Time has passed, and her memories have become faint. But that one phrase from her mother has been etched in the corner of her heart. Our beloved daughter, you must not forget our pride. No matter what happens, those are words that she intends to live by. After finishing her sword routine, Cirrus heard excited claps coming from Sillin's direction. Pretty Boy Priest was thoroughly amazed by her cool performance. Fascinated by how she could move so fluidly, Ceres answered that the key is just doing your best. That doesn't help Sillin, though. That the same answer that Rifen would give. It's probably a martial artist thing. Anyway, Sillin was having fun with Ceres. He was quite a fan of strong fighters and their bodies, after all. But the fun might have to be cut short when a familiar voice entered the courtyard. It was Romat and his men. He started by commanding Ceres to follow them. These people are up to no good. They have come all the way here under Tarek's order to get the female elf to her so-called true master. Ceres just looked at them nonchalantly. She did not falter one bit under Romad's ominous announcement. The group of multiple uniformed men slowly started pouring into the courtyard, taking their positions. Sillin clapped back and questioned these strangers as to who they were. Romad warned them not to expect rescue as they've already taken measures for that. Sillin was ignored even when he insisted that they wouldn't sell Ceres. One of the soldiers finally had enough of Sillin's yapping and drew his sword against the young priest. Ceres came in clutch and effectively parried the sword strike with the tiny dagger in her hand. The next thing you know, the aggressive soldier was already gurgling his own blood. His throat had been slit open. This angered the other soldiers and they came rushing in as a group while Ceres calmly ran circles around them. When she finally got enough space and time to work with, the Slayer Elf turned around and did what she did best. Two one-slash kills in the span of less than a second, this is the result of relentless training as a Slayer Slave. 
Romad and his goons did not expect to meet this much resistance when the plan was supposed to be an easy abduction of a slave, but this woman was just too strong. She dropped multiple soldiers without breaking a sweat. Sillin was not going to get overshadowed either. He called on Philonens to strike these disrespectful intruders with an iron mace. He wasn't able to finish the casting process because of a throwing knife heading towards his head. Thankfully, Ceres got him out of harm's way on time. Romad personally threw the knife, asserting that no one would say anything if a young pilgrim was killed in this place. Now, it has become too real for Sillin. It takes a special kind of bastard to interrupt a priest's incantation with the intent to kill, but Cirrus assured him that everything would be fine. She started walking forward while playing with the dagger in her hand. She took a casual combat stance and insisted that this bunch of bastards would not be a problem. Romad felt infuriated being dismissed so casually by a slave, but his men felt fear. Still, this guy was quite a resourceful leader. Instead of sending his men to certain death, he just called another ace up his sleeve. It's time for Talkata to work. Now Talkata is very different from those foolish soldiers that died in a blink of an eye. Silen and Cirrus braced themselves as this wouldn't be a simple fight at all. They are about to face an orc warrior. All Talkata knows is that he must work and catch that elf in front of him. Orc vocal cords cannot produce complicated human language. But he wanted to apologize to Cirrus, but this was her fate, so it's best to accept it. One look was enough to assess that Talkata's abilities are much better than those trashy humans. Cirrus was starting to doubt if she even stood a chance. But Romad's next orders might become key to this battle. He instructed Talkata to not leave any marks on the slave elf, and all Talkata does is follow orders. The first collision of the elf and orc warriors almost ended in a tragedy for Cirrus. She tried to block the first strike, but upon realizing that the sword would pierce through her body, it suddenly curved to the side at the last second. The blade did not graze her, but the impact and air compression that it produced pushed her away. This was just the start of Talkata's exhibition of strength and technique. Yet Ceres had almost died already. There's no doubt in her mind that this orc warrior was a strong veteran fighter. Now, she was regretting leaving her mithril scimitar in her room. The dagger's blade was just too short and small to retaliate against a monstrous opponent. Ceres tried to land a cheeky slash, but ended up getting parried into the air by Talkata's broadsword. Romad was getting frustrated watching the orc warrior on the sidelines like a coward. He kept on insulting their representative for taking too long to grab a little elf. Hearing that despicable man, he has to call Master Scream with his grating voice just means that Talkata is going to starve again tonight. But the job's still not done. The orc warrior has pushed the pace faster once again, forcing Cirrus to do nothing but dodge and block. Talkata was indifferent. He was just doing this for the sake of having something to eat. Ceres wasn't giving in. She would fight like a warrior to the end. The orc warrior finally took some massive steps to close the gap while the broadsword was primed for a devastating attack. Instead of blocking or dodging, the slayer actually chose to run even closer to the enemy. Takata was surprised and faltered for a moment. This elf was insane. He brought his broadsword down in a forceful slash, but Cirrus expertly deflected the blade's weight above her using a tiny dagger. When she got close to her kill range, Cirrus did not blink. She was not phased at all. It was as if she was moving with supreme confidence without fear. Talkata noticed that the elf girl had thrown the idea of dodging and defending away. Ceres was just coming in to remove the range disadvantage while knocking Talkata out of his game. This was the first time that she smiled a genuine smile after such a long time of being empty. That small dagger that Sillin bought on a whim started breaking through the tough skin. With a full-powered swing, she managed to nick Talkata's neck, causing it to spurt out blood. The orc's shoulder pads were also destroyed by the attack's force. Takata almost messed up the mission and killed the target. If he hadn't changed direction, Ceres would have gone. But the Slayer has already taken everything into account. She did what she did, believing in Takata's abilities. Sillin yelled at Ceres to block some flying daggers for a moment. Her limit would probably be just one block, though. For someone as talented as Sillin, that should be enough to get a spell off on time. Plus, he believes in Ceres. Romad saw the holy light and knew what was up, so he took out another throwing dagger while cursing at the priest. He threw the dagger with the flair and anger of an entitled brat. That's when Cirrus came in running with her impressive speed and remarkable reaction time, watching the trajectory of the flying dagger. This pathetic attack could not even compare to Talkata's swings, so it was easily deflected. A clutch block like that was enough for Sillin to conjure three apparitions of holy filaments. He beckoned these apparitions to beat up the damned bastards enthusiastically. Ceres was shocked to see this pretty boy actually performing something impressive with his holy magic. Romad, on the other hand, feared for his life. The apparitions of holy filaments situated on top of ornate scepters came flying to where the soldiers positioned themselves. 
It essentially destroyed the inn's courtyard, causing an impact that was felt throughout the area. Sillin immediately started running since his divine power only works on demons and the undead. That big show of destruction can only buy them some time to run away. Ceres had no time for this guy's pathetic running speed, so she picked him up from the scruff of his priest garb. The slayers also took the orc warrior's broadsword, tossing it into the air and kicking it forward. Its sharp blade lodged itself into a nearby wall where a window was situated nearby. Ceres followed the trajectory of the broadsword and jumped on its surface to use his footing. Utilizing the increased momentum from the steel's bending, she was able to propel herself and Sillin up into the higher floors of the inn. Once they reached the highest point, the slayer protected the pretty boy priest from the shards as she broke into a window. Romad was mad now that he and his unit had been beaten up by godly apparitions. He urgently ordered Talkata to give chase. But before the orc warrior could take another step, a composed voice berated Romad and his men for failing. The gentleman couldn't believe that all this fuss was because of an escaped female elf. An old man with a scruffy beard was fascinated that a slayer elf could fight with a veteran orc warrior and sneak out. He thinks that maybe it's about time to earn his keep too and asks where the elf went. Romad pointed up to the broken window and a surge of pure energy surrounded the old man. He casually lifted off the ground without a running start and while wearing heavy equipment. This mysterious old man smoothly entered through the broken glass in pursuit of Sillin and Cirrus. Even the arrogant Romad was humbled at the sight of that old man and those inhuman capabilities. This is Sir Lantas, an aura user under Tarek's employment, and this is how he rolls. For once, he was given a task that he might actually enjoy. He misses this feeling, the thrill of playing life or death hide-and-seek. Sillin and Cirrus don't know what's about to hit them. The distance to the door in the corridor seemed endless. Sillin suggested to Cirrus that he should go back to the room and take their equipment. He supposed there might be people there. However, they can take on one or two people. It's still better than running off with a single dagger. Ceres agreed with the plan. She was surprised that someone she thought was a naive child would be so focused in such a dangerous situation. The guy guarding the door heard the noise and turned his head in bewilderment to look. The first and probably the last thing he saw was Ceres preparing to strike. One punch from her was enough to knock the poor guy out. While Ceres was getting dressed, Sillin was panicking and pushing her along. He said they should grab their things and run away as soon as possible. He then started reciting some sort of protection spell that would help them hide. At the same time, Sir Lantus was already walking down the corridor of the inn, getting closer and closer to the room where our heroes were hidden. He was a swordsman who had reached a great level of skill with the sword. He was so skillful that he even managed to awaken his aura. An aura user can sense the movements of all living things within a radius of 30 meters, as if seeing them with their own eyes. That was why he was surprised to see that his opponents had just decided to hide in the room. However, after breaking down the door and finding no one, he realized his mistake. He had never thought that some kid would be able to use the concealment skill as a high-level cleric. It was obvious that they had already escaped. Suddenly, one of his subordinates came running to him and asked if they had managed to escape. They had, but Lantus was not going to give up so easily. He knew they couldn't have gotten far, so he immediately ordered to release the hounds to search for them. At about the same time, Ceres and Sillin tried to escape through the alleys of the city, Following Sillin, who had temporarily taken command, Cirrus asked if it would be better for them to go out into the street and get lost in the crowd. But he immediately rejected this idea, for if people realized that they were runaway slaves, they would surely turn against them. As a saint of the Holy Order, Sillin was protected. However, now, as a lone pilgrim, he realized how hard it was for those. However, giving up and returning to the Holy Order was obviously not a good option for him, for there was something more terrible waiting for him there. He told Cirrus that if Riefen were here, everything would have been resolved long ago. Hearing this, she asked incredulously if he was really that strong. Without answering, Sillin began to recite the spell. There was only one thing to do now, and that was to try to find him. A pink light illuminated the street. It was the spell that would lead them to Riefenheart. It was called the Crossroad of Destiny, and with the help of the strings of fate could point the way to their goal. Love turns coincidence into destiny, and a chance encounter turns fateful through love. It may just be a coincidence with a probability close to inevitability, but when it's blessed by filinance, it becomes destiny. This sacred spell was originally used to create couples that would be compatible with each other. It was clearly not intended for such use. However, there was no other way out. Turning to Cirrus, Sillin noted that she was very powerful. Before her, he had only seen one slayer named Lelcia, but she was not as strong as she was. Cirrus also noted that he was already at the level of a high-level cleric, despite his young age. After exchanging praises, Sillin was left surprised. While talking to Cirrus, he didn't feel like he was talking to a slave at all. While he was thinking about it, they had already reached the right place. It was to these ruins that the threads of fate were pointing. 
However, in the next moment our heroes realized that something was wrong. Out of the ruins slowly emerged a completely different person from the one they were looking for. It was Lantas. How could this happen? That was the question on Sillin's mind. Cirrus immediately prepared for battle. A smile appeared on Sir Lannis's face. He was grateful to these kids for giving him a good workout. He assumed that they were planning to try to escape again, so he advised them not to make that mistake again. Ceres also realized that if they tried to run away, they would leave their backs open. Already in the next instant, she had thrown herself at Lantas with a fierce scream. They had only one way to go. Defeat the enemy. In the blink of an eye, she got close to him and swung her sword. Lantis was an aura user, and Cirrus was clearly no match for him. Once behind her back, he noted that she was clearly not a novice slayer and that she was quite talented. Ceres desperately swung her sword behind her back, but it was useless. Sir Lantas was already in front of her. He also noted that she was trying very hard, which was unusual for a slave. Ceres was not interested in what he was saying. All she could think about was what kind of man was in front of her. As Sillin read the spell, he himself was pondering why a man of such skill was involved in this mess. With his abilities, he had to be at least a famous knight or swordsman. As he cast the spell, Cirrus's sword began to illuminate with a bright light. The girl was surprised at the power she received. Needless to say, even Lantas was surprised. After all, to cast so many high-level holy spells at the same time, one had to be of episcop level. It was hard to believe that the boy in front of him was one. Sillin proudly replied that he was quite famous in the south, then excitedly shouted to Cirrus to beat up that rascal. The next moment, a hail of blows fell on Lantas. However, he was well aware that these attacks were not the same as before. With the amplification of the saint, the elf had changed beyond recognition, but it was still not enough to defeat a person with an aura. Her sword as well as her hope of victory were completely destroyed. Sir Lantis counterattacked back, and his strike successfully reached its target. Blood spurted out. He said in a cold voice that they only underestimated him because he played along. Sillin was shocked and couldn't believe his eyes. In front of them was a person possessing an aura. However, despite that, Lannis couldn't help but admit that he had to use the aura on the lowly slayer. Sitting beside the injured Ceres, Sillin wondered in despair what an aura user was doing in such a place. People of this level could live in luxury anywhere. Using it just to catch an elf slave was tantamount to getting a dragon to fire up the furnaces. While he was pondering this, reinforcements arrived to join Lantas. Sillin was very surprised when he heard the name. He had heard of this man before. His full name was Lantis von Kalpenard. He was a famous knight of the Taken Kingdom. Being a descendant from a noble family, he displayed astonishing battle prowess after awakening his aura as early as 30 years old. The entire kingdom rejoiced at the birth of a new aura user. However, Lantis had one terrible secret that he couldn't share with others. He had an unspeakably terrible personal entertainment. It started with the elf slaves before moving on to the humans of the city of Royal. Eventually, it even crossed over to the nobility. Thus, he became the greatest disgrace in the history of the Taken Kingdom. Upon recognizing what kind of person was in front of him, Sillin came to be horrified. Seeing his reaction, Sir Lantis said that he must have known a lot about him. That was true, for Sillin had often been told that if he wandered at night, Lantis would come after him. The childhood injuries were still making themselves felt. Sillin also began to say that he was actually justifying the rumors. After all, what self-respecting aura user would take on such dastardly deeds? Hearing this, Lantis replied with a smile that he was someone who was just trying to live off his salary. He confessed to killing hundreds in the Taken Kingdom, and after that, he fled here. And it's been a long time since he last played tag. Romad noted that to the Rolifine trade unions, Sir Lantis's disgrace was of very little importance. They could give him the dirty work, and he would get money and freedom. It was a profitable partnership for both of them. In addition, it was his strength that made this trading company the second largest in just ten years. Lantis was determined to seal Sillin's divine power. Shooting several aura bullets at him, he said that he knew very well that the best solution was to silence the high-level cleric, because it could turn out badly for him in the future. Romad worriedly told Sir Lantis to try not to hurt the elf anymore, but he replied that they could always heal her. Then turning his gaze to Sillin, Lantis noted that he was quite handsome. He didn't know anything at all, so he offered to take her with him. Sillin immediately cried out in panic that he was a man and would not go anywhere with them. As it turned out, however, that wasn't a problem for Lantas. He always wanted some kind of new experience. Romad reached out to grab the frightened Sillin. However, all he ended up with was a wound on his arm. Interest appeared on Lantis's face. He couldn't understand how the boy could stand on his feet with his tendons cut. In his opinion, he was the brightest, most beautiful, and fragile zombie in the world. He also said that although he didn't want to do it, it looked like he'd have to amputate his limbs. 
there was a look of horror on Sillin's face. The next moment, one of the walls was instantly destroyed by an explosion, which caught the attention of everyone present. Sillin opened his eyes wide in surprise. He had already guessed who it was. Riefen appeared from the cloud of smoke and said in a cold voice that he had finally found those bastards. His anger and rage was hard to describe in words. They dared to touch his cirrus, and so they had to pay for it. Riefen's sudden appearance made everyone freeze in place. Under their surprised looks, he threw off his jacket and walked straight past Sir Lantis, who could only wonder who was so cocky to show up. One glance of the experienced warrior was enough to realize that this young man was not just an ordinary well-built kid. Sir Lantis could even sense his very strong aura and kept wondering who he was. Romad had already met him, so he told him that he was the one who bought the Slayer Elf. However, Rifen's appearance did not fit the description of the buyer, who, according to Romad, was just a random kid. Now Sir Lantis felt all his feelings going off the charts just by looking at him. And he called him a random kid? There was no doubt about it. He was an aura user too. But looking at him, he couldn't understand how. How was he able to master aura at such a young age? Sir Lantis finally came to the conclusion that the guy was only young in appearance and, in reality, he must be in his forties. It's been a while since he met someone as strong as Rafen. Our hero only grinned as he prepared for the fight and advised his opponent not to pretend to be a knight when in fact he is just a dirty pervert old geezer. Sir Lantis did not have to wait long for a reaction, and in the next moment he rushed to attack. Our hero was also ready, and his fists were already blazing with aura. Each of them rushed forward with their weapons. Our hero only had his fists, while Sir Lantis was already taking out his sword. Their attacks met, and everything around them lit up with a flash from the collision of two powerful auras. The explosion was so strong that the bricks of the stone wall flew apart like small pebbles. In this chaos, Rifen's figure towered over the old knight, but despite our hero's powerful blows, the knight wasn't simple and deflected each of his blows while striking back. They seemed to be evenly matched. It was a legendary battle between two worthy rivals. The others, however, had to be careful. Romad understood this well and shouted to his warriors to run away, otherwise they would all die, being swept away by some random blow of these two titans. While Sillin was treating Cirrus, Riffin continued to destroy the fortress walls in the heat of battle with his opponent. Ceres was surprised that Mr. Riffenhart is an aura user. It was just that Sillin had neglected to tell her about such a minor detail. Ceres, on the other hand, was seeing something like this for the first time and watched her new master's movements as if mesmerized. Meanwhile, Sir Lantis couldn't understand what was going on. This guy's skill level was clearly not that of someone who had recently awakened his aura. His movements were too confident and his gaze was like an old man who had learned the meaning of life. On top of that, he controlled his aura as skillfully as he controlled his fists, even deflecting with aura bullets some of his attacks. Sir Lantis realized that he was simply too proficient with aura. There were only two possibilities. He had either awakened his aura in his teens, or he was actually over 40 years old and still had his baby face. Anyway, both cases were too unlikely and seemed completely pointless. The battle continued, and neither of them were going to back down. Our hero was beginning to wonder why this damn knight was so strong. How could some filthy pervert who tried to put a hand on Cirrus use swordsmanship as precise as this? But it didn't really matter, because he was going to beat up anyone who said martial arts were only good for building character. All of Lantis's attacks had been deflected, and he didn't understand how that was possible. This guy was able to repel all of his sword attacks with his bare hands. He really has incredible skills. Who could he be? There was only one obvious option. So Lantis asked if he was a disciple of the Martial King Gerard. Rifen wasn't even going to answer this so-called knight, but he still wondered why he was so caught up over some slave when he's this strong. Rifen couldn't stand such disrespect to his beloved. How dare this old pervert call her a slave? He was already furious at the way people treated the other races. They don't even want to admit that those slaves have their emotions and will. Lantis even froze in surprise. It was the first time he had heard such nonsense, and probably for the last time because our hero was about to teach him a lesson. How could Lantis call them slaves when he had never even spoken to them properly? Had he ever once in his life wondered why they were considered slaves? Literally one blow from Rifen, and the wall crumbled. Lantis wasn't going to give up so easily and successfully dodge the blow. He still couldn't understand what kind of nonsense he was spouting again and again. This reaction was nothing new to our hero. He had seen it many times before in his past life. It's just that they believe that all beings other than humans are inferior. And this belief is so deep-rooted throughout all of humanity that they simply cannot even admit that they are wrong. They see that these otherworldly species laugh and cry, yet they don't think that they have emotions. And anyway, how are humans better than elves that they treat them as slaves? Surprisingly, 
Lantus had something to say to all these accusations. He thought that it's only natural that humans take otherworldly species as slaves as the lords of creation. That is what his godsayer said. What could they be if not slaves? Rifen didn't understand why the heirs of the great fairies would be born to be slaves. Had he never considered that if humans didn't dominate the world, they could be slaves? When humans took orcs as slaves, humanity celebrated in joy. It was the same with the dwarves and the elves. All because it's human nature to use the weak for our own self-interest and greed. Our hero could not accept that. He was sure that if someone permit others to become slaves, then he's permitting himself to become one too. Lantus was shocked. It seemed to him that this guy was really mad. How could he really think that elves are equal to humans? But mad or not, Riffin's strength was unbridled and Lantas barely had time to dodge. The wounds that covered Riffin's entire body were mere scratches to him, and he was determined to prove to this old pervert that Cirrus was no slave. And his determination was as strong as his blows. He wanted to change everything. After all, the slave system that had taken root on the continent was not only bad for the other races, but also for the weak and poor people who were forced to live a life of half-slavery. That is, serfdom is. The implementation of a wrong ideology always comes back to bite you in the back, but the foolish humans are not yet aware. Nor did Lantas yet realize his defeat. In the next instant, his defenses were already broken, and he received a mighty kick from our hero, soundly kissing the wall. That's when he realized that this was his end. As Rifen continued to talk about his philosophy of life, he believed that if this vicious chain of slavery is not broken, if the beliefs of mankind remain unchanged, one day, absolutely everyone will live in fear of these chains. That must be changed. Lannis realized that Rifen would not spare him, and he would only be the first link in the chain he was going to break. Rifen was convinced that he had to change it. Change it, no matter what it would cost. The next blow Lantus couldn't dodge. It was the end. The blow was so strong that it just crushed him into the wall. And then it blew him with the wall. His flight was short and soon ended with him hitting another wall. Rifen was ready to change all that, no matter what so that no one would ever dare or even be able to call Cirrus a slave again, so that no one could even think of anyone else as a slave. Our hero was ready to change the whole world for her. Cirrus herself was quite surprised by such loud speeches and only wondered if he was insane. But even if he seemed insane to her, his words touched her to the core of her being and brought back memories of her childhood. She was reminded of her mother's words, who had said that they were the descendants of the great fairy. Surprisingly, even after such powerful blows, Lantus was still alive, and moaned among the ruins, begging to be saved and spared. Rifen found the idea highly dubious, so he asked why he should save a perverted bastard like him. Lantus was ready to say anything in the face of death, and swore with his sword that he would put away all his sins for the rest of his life and use his life to do good. Our hero noticed that the expression on the bastard's face didn't look at all as if he was telling the truth. On top of that, he really hated the Sayer Holy Order, because participants of this order can commit all sorts of evil things as long as they confess at the temple. If he really wanted to repent, he should convert and never come to the Sayer Temple again. Lantus cried out in desperation that he would do as he said, and our hero didn't need to get his hands dirty in blood at all because of a bastard like him. But that was a poor argument. Dirty blood already stained his hands, especially in his past life. Lantus didn't even think about what he was saying and agreed with everything and believed his word. Reefen was definitely not going to spare the bastard anymore and said that since he had actually repented, he probably thought he deserved to die. And surely he still thinks he should die quickly to pay for his sins that he had already put aside? Ceres and Sillen had already realized what was about to happen and froze in horror. With one final blow, Reifen ended this perverted knight's life forever. All he could say was that he shouldn't have used the word repent so haphazardly. That's not something a bastard like him should be saying. Still, the aftermath of their battle was impressive and our hero wondered if all his companions were safe and sound. By this time, Sillen had already finished the treatment, and Rafen just couldn't help but say that he is one of the best first aid kits. Luckily for him, Sillen didn't realize what he meant. Suddenly, Cirrus spoke and asked our hero if he was okay. Such an emotional blow was stronger than from Lantis. Rifen was shocked that Cirrus was the first to speak to him, even though her voice was colder than ever. To her, on the other hand, he was a really weird guy. Romad and a few other soldiers tried to use this moment to quietly slip away, but they failed because Sillen noticed them. Rafen threateningly asked them if they were going to escape. Well, they could try, but then he would definitely let them experience something new. Romad was scared to death and froze in place. A new experience was definitely not in his plans, and he was ready to answer all the questions of Rifen, who asked who gave him those orders. Of course our hero was sure they wouldn't crack so easily, and that was expected. But he had one proven tool called a training club, 
which he was ready to use with all possible mercy. The poor guys were scared when they saw the club in his hands and couldn't understand what it had to do with mercy. It soon became clear when, under the moonlight, the three bad guys were beaten properly, and Riffin asked them again, what bastard had organized all of this? The poor guys had actually been ready to tell everything before they were beaten, but now they were just rushing to tell what they knew. It was Tariq, the union leader of the Rolofane Trade Union. They even revealed that he lived on the southern outskirts of Zeppelin and explained how to get there. Tarek, that fat bastard, was well known to our hero, for it was he who had abused Cirrus for ten years in his last life. In the past, Riefen wanted to kill the bastard right after he saved Cirrus, but unfortunately when he found him, he was already dead in his bed. Now Romad, seeing the look on our hero's face, realized what he was going to do and said that even he wouldn't be able to get to him. Tarek owns the second largest trade union in the Chatan Principality, and if Riefen dares to do anything to him, he will definitely become an enemy of Chatan. Our hero was aware of that himself, but that didn't stop him at all. He just knew too well what kind of bastard Tarek was. As promised, Riffin let them live and advised them to stay together so they wouldn't freeze to death. Romad's friends liked that idea much better than he did, especially his warm chest and even his cries not to touch him didn't help. It was too cold outside and it seemed that nothing could save him from a very dubious experience. Meanwhile, back at the Tarek mansion, Karen was wondering when they would get that elf girl back. Tarek was curious about that too. Normally Ramad didn't linger like this and accomplished things quickly. With them in the room were also two frightened elven girls who had been bought specifically as payment for Sir Lantas. Soon they heard a strange loud sound in the hallway, but Tarek didn't pay much attention to it as he thought it was just all sorts of peasants and servants rebelling and making noise. But he was wrong as the last of his soldiers were falling one by one in the corridor and they were not defeated with weapons at all. Common slaps from our hero were enough to defeat them all. Even though he was holding back, it was getting harder and harder not to kill them. And Sillin was constantly having to heal knocked out guards. But the healing didn't end there. Sillin also cast a spell that blurred their hurtful memories. Thus, thanks to his abilities, they left no witnesses behind them. Of course, our hero could have walked in here himself and come back with that bastard's head. But his friends also wanted to see that bastard get beaten to death. And in that case, the memory removal skill was very useful. Suddenly, another obstacle appeared right in front of them. Talkata, who was determined to do his duty and block the intruders. Rifen wanted to resolve things peacefully, insisting that Talkata had the blood of a warrior in him, and the one he was protecting was not worthy of his protection. So why then wield a sword for him? But Talkata stood his ground. He is a warrior, and he has a duty as one who wields a sword. If he was to get swept away and bend his will, how could he be called a warrior? Rifen reminded him that he lives as a slave, and the man he served was not his mentor. Takata still remained steadfast, even if that man was not worthy, such is the duty of a warrior to fulfill the task you have been given, even if that is forced. It was expected of the orc, he was too straightforward and stubborn. Sillin, on the other hand, was surprised in another way. How could Rifen speak orc? Suddenly Cirrus stepped in and said she would take care of the orc and let Rifenheart move on. This time she had a different, more suitable weapon in her hands and now they could fight on equal terms. Takata took one look to realize that this weak elf had become stronger. Our hero trusted Ceres completely and moved on. But lastly, he asked Selin to watch her and watch her back. It was absolutely no problem for him. That was his expertise. Talkata, seeing Rifen walk past him, asked the strong man why he was ignoring him. Had he decided to head towards Tarek right now? Our hero answered him that now his opponent is the elf girl in front of him, and the fact that he is paying attention to him now is disrespectful to his opponent. Talkata couldn't argue with such a statement, and our hero only once again remarked that orcs are like this. Soon Rifen reached a door through which purple smoke was pouring. It was unmistakably the nasty smell of pink smoke. And as he peered through the door, his eyes widened with horror. The whole room was drowned in that smoke, and the blood spatter on the wall completed the picture. In the middle of the room stood two perverted bastards we already know, who, under the influence of the pink smoke, didn't even realize who had dared to break into their room and interrupt their fun. When they frantically called for security, expectantly no one answered them. At the door stood only a very angry Riefenheart, who had seen all sorts of dirty acts in his life and had never seen anything like this. And this was something he certainly couldn't forgive them for. Those bastards had to pay for their deeds. Tarek was furious at the sight of the strange intruder, who also saw what they were doing and began to ask who he was and what he was doing here. His gaze immediately fell on the two dead elven women lying on the floor. Saying that Riefen was furious was a very mild way of putting it. He didn't understand why there were so many people in this world that he shouldn't have let live. Tarek started calling desperately for Talkata. He didn't understand what was happening or where his guards had gone. 
Since no one showed up to his cries, he decided to try to negotiate. He started to ask what he wanted, if he needed money. Seeing no interest on the guy's face, he realized that he had probably come for the work of the Taoban trade union. He started to panic, promising to pay him twice as much as his employer, but it wasn't about the money. No. It pained Rifen to realize that Ceres, in his past life, had been a slave to this trash for ten years. He hadn't changed a bit. Trash doesn't change. Seeing that the guy's mood had worsened even more, Tarek panicked and started to say that he would immediately write up a contract. However, his words were little more than mere sound. Our hero didn't need anything he was offering. All he wanted now was his death. Even after the blow, Tariq still didn't understand what was going on and why he was being beaten. However, in the next moment, our hero explained that it was all because he dared to touch his series. A look of bewilderment appeared on the fatty's face. He didn't even understand who he was talking about, but he was never meant to find out. Reefen had done to him what he had done to his slaves. To summarize Tarek's impressions, he didn't like it. To say the least, even Karen didn't like it, or he just realized he was next in line. Tarek was dead. Before he died, Riffin had managed to make him feel the full range of sensations Cirrus had once felt. That should have been enough. Karen, horrified by what he had seen, began to accuse our hero of being a murderer. Riffin was amused to hear the words of a man who also killed, and for fun. However, as it turned out, he did not think so. In his opinion, he lived his life without guilt. To what our hero replied that such trash like him really had no conscience. At the same time, Cirrus and Sillin came into the room. It was not a pretty sight, dead bodies and pools of blood. Even in Cirrus' opinion, it was quite brutal. However, Rafin didn't think it was wrong. In his opinion, those bastards deserved much worse. Sillin also agreed with him. They were real trash. Ceres was surprised that Sillin didn't even flinch at the sight of so many corpses. The one explained that he had just spent a long time traveling. He also informed our hero that Cirrus had taken care of Talkata and that he hadn't even helped her. However, that wasn't entirely true, for she wouldn't be standing here if he hadn't healed her. Sillin's words were true. Luckily, Talkata was not dead. He was wounded and his breathing was weak, but he was still alive. Suddenly, their conversation was interrupted by the last of the bastards, Karen. Seeing Cirrus, he immediately remembered that she was the slayer he had brought back. Looking at the dead elves, Cirrus asked in a cold voice if he was the one who killed them. The one asked in desperation what she would do if he was. Ceres had an answer to that question. His death was clearly not enough to make up for the death of the child as well as everyone else he had killed. However, it was the least she could do right now. It was really hard to keep alive a trash who didn't understand why she was going to kill him over some slave. The very next moment, Karen's heartbreaking scream was heard. In death agony, he reached for the dead elf looking for salvation. But his attempts were futile. In the next instant, the blade pierced his heart, ending his life forever. Ceres was not going to let such a bastard touch her with his filthy hands. Rifen watched all of this in silence. He was sorry that she had to go through something like this again. He promised himself that he would be stronger and do everything he could to make sure it didn't happen again. It was deep night over the snow-covered winter forest. A fire was burning on a clearing in the middle of the forest, and many elves and orcs who had been slaves of Tarek and Karen were gathered around it. Takata reported to Ceres that he had gathered all the slaves that were in that place. In response to her thanks, he replied that he didn't need to be thanked. He bowed his sword. For from now on, her master was his master. Observing the present, Sillin noted that the gender ratio was rather odd. But for Cirrus, there was nothing unusual about it, for male elves and orc women were not popular at all. Watching what Rifen did and said, Cirrus began to doubt the validity of her thoughts about him. Though his words were loud and seemingly impossible, she felt in her heart that he spoke from the heart. However, her thoughts were disturbed by Rifen returning back to their small camp. Unfolding the scroll he had brought, he explained that it was a slave contract that bore the seal of the leader of the Rolifans Union. It was quite difficult to find, as it was a very important document. When Sillin asked him where he had gotten it, Rifen proudly replied that he had stumbled upon the safe when he had broken down one of the office walls. Sillin didn't share his emotions, and remarked that it was barbaric, just his style. Our hero immediately excused himself, saying that in all his fifty years of life, no one had ever said anything like that to him. But the next thing he knew, he realized his mistake. He was still not used to the fact that he was in a completely different body, and he also had a feeling that he was gradually turning into a barbarian. The answer to the question of why he needed a slave contraption was quite simple. Addressing everyone present, Rifen said that anyone who no longer wanted to live the life of a slave, he would grant them freedom. Freedom? It was an almost unfamiliar word to the elves and orcs. They knew its meaning, but they could not imagine what it meant to them. 
It was sad to learn that they did not even understand what he was offering them. Sillen asked Rifen if he intended to engage in the slave trade, but the answer was obvious to our hero. He had no intention of selling them to anyone. Then Sillen asked Rifen if he had decided to stop traveling and settle down somewhere. However, that was not the case. In fact, Rifen had written a contract stating that all slaves were free, and once he put his seal, all of them would no longer be slaves of Tarek. On the other hand, letting these guys go who didn't even have a home was just self-satisfaction of his supposed justice. By such an action, he would most likely expose them to other dangers. First and foremost, he had to teach them how to survive in this world. After a while, a rather interesting company gathered in Sivolt Tauban's office. The merchant found out that the slaves who had arrived were Tareks and asked our hero in bewilderment if he had bought them all. Riefen replied that he would find out later, but in the meantime, he had a request to take care of them in secret. He also added that he would hear interesting news tomorrow morning, and the one to figure out the truth of the matter would be he. And if the secret came out, the only suspect would be him alone. While Savolt was thinking about what he was up to, our hero told him not to worry too much about it because it was just a simple threat. In the next moment, he also threw a pile of gold on the table. In Rafin's opinion, 100 gold coins should have been enough for him to take care of the slaves. But from the expression on the merchant's face, he could easily tell that it was too much. Savolt immediately thought that he must have robbed the Rolofane estate, but he did not refuse the deal. He told our hero that he had a place near Zeppelin, and if he put slaves there, no one would know about it. Rifen also wanted Savolt to promise that no one would touch them or treat them as slaves but him. Savolt replied that he would definitely see to that, but a hundred coins as payment still seemed too much for him. Our hero replied that he also wanted him to use the money for their training. Savolt Taoban was surprised, because he thought that they had already been educated as slaves of Tariq. However, Rifen was not talking about slave education. Language and numbers, depending on how they do, accounting, history, history, philosophy as well, if possible, medicine and healing too. Those were the things he had to teach them. Sivolt Tauban couldn't understand why Riffin would go to such an extent for some slaves, so he asked about it. Our hero replied that there was nothing strange about it. The more skilled a slave was, the more convenient it was for his owner. However, the merchant didn't believe that a slave could learn something like that. Riffin replied that he would understand in time, but in the meantime they talked about his money. He should not worry about anything, but just do what he asked. After a moment's thought, Sivolt replied that he would try, but he also clarified that it would be difficult to do so, since few people would be willing to teach a slave. Our hero knew very well that teachers were very arrogant people. However, even so, he had a solution. Teachers always had students, so they were their salvation. Among the students, one could always find a few peasants who were in need of money. Sivolt Tauban understood what our hero was suggesting, but he could not understand how students who hadn't finished their studies could teach. Rifen was not going to demand some high level of education. He just wanted them to get the basics. Eventually, Sivolt Taoban gave up and agreed to fulfill this assignment. But he still didn't believe that the slaves could learn anything. In his opinion, it was like teaching math to a dog or a cat. In fact, slave training was not such a wonder. In our hero's past life, there had been a few people who had suggested the idea. But the upper class and most slave owners didn't accept it. Like Sivolt, they also compared it to training animals all because of the stereotype that other races were inferior to humans. But even so, Riefen intended to use that stereotype as an advantage. The stereotype was just a cover. The real reason why the nobles didn't want to train slaves was because it was a great measure against their resistance. The smarter and more educated a slave was, the better chance he had of escaping or rebelling. Once the slaves started getting educated, Savolt Taoban would be sure to be shocked at how capable they really were and once he realized this, he would begin to educate his own slaves. After all, it was much more convenient for the owner if his slave was skilled. And if things went smoothly, the trend of training slaves could spread across the continent. Changing people's minds was what Rifen wanted, and what he had failed to accomplish in his previous life. Now was the time to start it. After a while, our heroes returned to the inn. As it turned out, Rifen was back to where he started. He had no money again. So he reluctantly began to ask Sillen if he had any money. At Sillen's puzzled look, our hero replied that he had accidentally given all the money to Sivolt. Upon hearing this, Cirrus immediately asked if she had to return her outfit to get the refund. Riffin replied in a panic that she didn't have to, nor did she have to worry about the situation. He didn't notice, but that was the first time she had ever laughed ever since becoming a slave. As one might expect, the next morning at Zeppelin was restless. The reason for this was that two dead bodies were discovered, which belonged to the great trade union Rolofane's leader Tarek and the Karen trade union's successor Beret. The culprits were unknown, 
as none of the guards remembered almost nothing. Eventually, the case was dismissed for lack of evidence and confusion. Two weeks later, our heroes went to clean up another dungeon. The battle with monsters was impressive. While Sillin was getting rid of the undead with holy magic, Cirrus was effortlessly destroying skeletons with her blade. Rifen, who was observing all of this, noted that they worked really well together. While the skeletons continued to persistently try to destroy the obsidian with the stone pickaxe, but more specifically, Sillin was adjusting to Ceres's needs. In simple terms, he was the best support. Rifen was curious to know how old he was when he started entering the battlefield to achieve this. Sillin was much stronger and more capable than our hero had expected. He guessed that if he continued to improve at this rate, he could become a stronger priest than his arch-nemesis, Saintess Aline. Rifen even wondered why he had not become famous in his past life. As it turned out, these ruins were too tedious for Sillin. In his opinion, the monsters here were stronger than in Palton. If we talk about how our heroes ended up here, they arrived in the Kingdom of Graeme two weeks after traveling to Chitan. It was there, near the Settelard Mountains, that the forgotten ancient ruins of Elusion were located. The reason they had come here was because it was the place where Rafen could restore his magical power. Just like that, they found themselves in front of a door that was sealed with magical power. There seemed to be no way out, because it was impossible to open the door with physical force. But as it turned out, there was no need, for Rifen began to cast a spell. Sillin was surprised and incredulously asked if he could really use magic. After confirming this, Sillin froze in shock, for he had never heard of a martial mage. He couldn't help but be jealous, for in front of him was a person who not only had excellent martial skills, but could also use magic. That wasn't fair at all. But after a moment, it turned out that Rifen was very bad with magic. In fact, even for a third circle spell, it took him a long time to accumulate mana. Not paying attention to Sillin's barbed remarks, our hero continued to persistently cast the spell. And after a moment, a miracle happened. The door finally lit up with a bright light. Simply put, he was able to open the door, though with difficulty. It took him 30 minutes. It was so pitiful that Sillin advised him not to tell anyone else that he was a mage. In his past life, Rifen had been the world's first ten-circle mage, and so he could no longer tolerate the fact that he was now so bad at magic. He had to get Lucian's voice as soon as possible. However, when he arrived at the right place, nothing but disappointment awaited him. After all, the place where the artifact was supposed to be was completely empty. Not quite empty. In the corner stood some strange branch, which did not look like some expensive artifact at all. Finding nothing else, our heroes made the decision to head back. Riefen was particularly disappointed, as he couldn't believe that it had turned out this way. Sillin reassured him, saying that they could not always be the first. The problem was that according to our hero's memories, Elusion was to be discovered only after 17 years, and it was he, in a past life, who had found it first. There was only one conclusion to draw from this. The future had changed. Sillin and Cirrus were still happy because they had gotten something after all. Sillin thought that this strange branch must be a good artifact. And so it was. In the next instant, the branch glowed with a bright green light and turned into a magical bow. It had the name Nihilin, and it shot magical arrows created from mana. Depending on how concentrated the wielder was, the number of shots that could be fired in a row depended on how much concentration he had. It looked like an ordinary stick, but it was actually a branch of the Elfenheim Tree of Life. Well, what was to be expected from such an artifact? Its power was incredible. Everyone was impressed by its power, and even Cirrus confirmed that it was an excellent weapon. But there was still one outstanding question. Turning to our hero, Sillin asked how he even realized that this old branch was an artifact. Rifen couldn't answer that it was Cirrus's main weapon in his past life, so he simply said that he had heard of it before. Sillin continued his futile attempts to comfort our hero, telling him how many more ancient ruins there were on the continent. But all those ruins were not enough for none of them contained a relic that could replace Elusian's voice. After all, it was the only artifact that could help our hero restore his magical powers. Finally, they arrived at the village of Gahalan, and Sillin couldn't wait to eat the food that someone else had prepared. Since when they travel, it was always him who did the cooking, and his dream came true. As soon as they entered the local tavern, a rich table was set before them. The tavern lady was quite pleased that they enjoyed her food so much. It wasn't surprising, though, as her cooking skills were top tier though not everyone shared her opinion. For example, she had recently had guests who were always complaining about the food. They must have thought they were food critics. There was a group of knights from a noble family here a week ago. They were all talking amongst themselves about exploring some ruins or something similar. When our hero heard that, he immediately tensed and offered to tell her more about them for an extra fee. But she refused the money and agreed to tell everything for nothing because telling stories is not a job. 
A week ago, Viscount Kelburn arrived here with the Explore team, but surprisingly those who arrived with Viscount looked even higher in rank than him. One of the knights was even fully armed in gold. She even had fun watching him, all shiny from head to toe. Though he was nice. Rifen listened to her intently and put the facts together in his head. The golden armor and the golden sword, it couldn't be mistaken for anything else. There was only one person that fit that description, the golden knight of the Graham Kingdom's Count Tennis family, many miles away from our hero in Kelberin's castle. Two noble men were dining, Sir Eusus and Viscount Kelberin. Kelberin couldn't stop praising the noble knight for the way he had skillfully eliminated all the monsters in the ruins, but he didn't consider it all his own merits and thanked Kelberin for his help. But the latter still did not calm down and told him without stopping that it was expected from the Golden Knight of Graham. And what an honor it was for him to be able to witness his incredible skills. All this stream of flattery was for a reason, and Sir Eusus, who was Tennis family's knight commander, decided to assure him that he could not worry. After all, a third of all the treasures found in the ruins would be his as they had agreed before. Money was not important to Viscount Kelberin, at least that's what he said. He pretended that the honor of fighting alongside Sir Eusus was enough for him and that he didn't need the relic at all. He didn't even mind Sir Eusus taking all the treasures found there, because he knew that he had enough money as it was, and it would be much more profitable to get a good relationship with Sir Eusus. Then over their small talk, they discussed what Viscount Kelbrin had done with the Adamante and Orichalcum that were found on his lands. As it turned out, he had ordered his slaves to mine it for weapons. Sir Eusus was not at all surprised. For the Kelberin family was known for its mining industry and for having many talented blacksmiths among the slave dwarves. It came about that Viscount Kelberin used this opportunity to introduce such a high-ranking guest to his two daughters. Even though Sir Eustace was married, he thought it would be good for them to get to know him. But the guest thought otherwise and replied that he was not going to even come within a few meters of any woman other than his wife. Such an answer was very strange to Kelberin. Had he offended him in some way? According to rumors, he was a very unfaithful husband. Immersed in his thoughts, Kelberin had the imprudence to think aloud of the guest's younger sibling. Immediately, there was the sound of breaking glass. Sir Eustace crushed his glass and declared in a quiet, threatening voice that he had no younger sibling. Then the frightened Viscount Kelberin realized that he had made a grave mistake and began to apologize, but it was too late. Kelberin was saved by a loud noise outside, which shook the whole castle. A servant flew into the room and shouted that, A demon has appeared from one of the relics, a horrible centaur-like demon also known as Sefiatan. He had appeared right in the middle of the inner courtyard of the fortress and was now smashing everything around him, scattering soldiers and stones like garbage. Sir Eustace watched from the window, wondering if there was any artifact that could summon this monster. Suddenly, what he saw made him pale. That stupid bastard, his cousin. There was one guy among the knights who took command amidst the chaos and ordered everyone to keep an eye on the monster sword, evacuate people, and maintain the formation. The mages he sent to the back line, and he ordered the knights to raise their shields. He himself stepped forward. At his command, the mages prepared a freezing spell to hold the demon in place. And soon the will of ice spell bound the demon with a multitude of ice crystals. Now that the monster was trapped, it was time to spring into action. The others were sure that this was enough, and all they had to do was keep going and wait for the commander to show up. But not this guy, whose name was Russ. The rest of the warriors were shocked at what he was about to do. But that didn't stop him. He believed that the evil demon right in front of him was no enemy in front of Tennis's sword. With a battle cry, he lunged at the demon. But despite his determination, he could only scratch the monster slightly. Soon his joyous expression at having struck the demon was soon replaced by fear and the realization that he couldn't dodge the blow. So he had to block it. His sword broke and he fell and flew back a few meters. One of his friends came to his aid. While Russ was recovering, the irreparable happened. The demon swung his sword again. And right in front of Russ, his friend was blown to pieces, and so did the ice that was holding the demon back. He only managed to whisper in a trembling voice, Brother, luckily their commander Eusus had already arrived and ordered stupid idiots like this one off the battlefield, and the mages to maintain the ice ring. He looked at Russ and asked contemptuously, Who is his brother? The great knights of tennis are not born from the stomachs of dirty stray dogs. Russ dared not even reply. Sir Eusus was immediately confronted by the demon Sefiatan, and decided to see if it was really a demon that no aura user could stand up to. Eusus had one very powerful argument, his giant golden sword, which he wielded masterfully. It was a magical sword that allowed the user to gain power equal to an aura user. It was called Eldrad, and now Eusus began to cast a spell to awaken it. The sword glowed, and a multitude of golden particles began to separate from it. They began to surround and attach themselves to Eusus, completely covering him in magical golden armor. 
creating an invulnerable magical armor. Now in full armor, he was ready to fight the demon, and to the cheering shouts of his soldiers, he said, Come, demon of the other world. At the same time, many miles away, our hero in a quiet inn kept talking about this very golden knight. And Sillen was quite surprised that Rifen didn't know such a famous person, but he justified it by the fact that he lived all the time in the mountains. Still, it was strange that he didn't know the strongest magical swordsman on the continent, so strong that he could even be compared to an aura user. Even Cirrus being a slave had heard of him. However, although Riffin didn't know who wore these artifacts at this time, he was well aware of their properties. Paying attention to Sirius, our hero couldn't help but notice how good her pajamas looked, and asked if she felt good in them. But still returning to the topic of their conversation, Sillin didn't understand how they could compare even a strong magical swordsman to an aura user. It's just the power of a magic tool, after all. But Riffin corrected him that this Eldrad magic armor is not simple at all. It is considered the strongest magic armor of the current age although being able to proficiently use that is another issue altogether. This artifact is made of a special material, true gold eldril, which is a magic metal several times rarer than true silver mithril. The magic armor Eldrad and magic sword Eldrin, both made from that true gold, is the highest ranking artifact from the relics of the Silver Age, and has been passed down through the Tennis County for generations. The magic swordsman who uses Eldrad and Eldrin is called the Golden Knight. Those who wear these both powerful artifacts can activate incredibly powerful magic just by simple declaration. It's allowing user to gain access to fighting power on par with an aura user. Right at this moment, Yusus finished reciting the spell, saying, Let me become a feather that rides the wind. The only question was whether he would be able to use this power properly, and judging by his movements, he had learned the experience of generations before him very well. His sword cut through the demon's flesh like a knife through butter, and he jumped high above the monster, preparing to deliver another devastating blow. To do so, he awakened his Eldrin sword, which immediately burst into flames. The demon only had time to let out one last howl. Before the full power of the sword, along with the eighth circle spell, material destruction fell upon him. That he could use such spells was not surprising, for the Tennis County is at least a family that's researched how to properly use Eldred's power. However, just because he has a strong tool doesn't mean it's always absolutely strong. Such statements from our hero surprised Sillen, who knew that aura users usually don't recognize magical swordsmen. And the reason was simple, simply because Tennis County's magic armor utilization techniques are more profound than most sword techniques. Eusus's actions on the battlefield clearly demonstrated this. From what Rifen had heard about the family, they had lost their proper sword techniques and had to rely on relics. But from their family's perspective, that's actually better. Even if Air work hard to polish his sword techniques, he can't be sure of becoming an aura user but there will always be one golden knight in each generation. And always having a such strong warrior with the force of an aura user in the family is a great benefit. Well, Eusus is no doubt capable. And the way he was skillfully going to finish the demon with another spell was impressive. Finally, after such a blow, a flash of light struck him, and he once again slashed the demon's flesh with a hail of lightning-fast blows. But this time was the last, and the demon began to fall to the ground to the enthusiastic shouts of the soldiers. Only Russ watched this with an absent expression on his face. The Golden Knight. Eusus bathed in the rays of glory and the setting sun on the background of the defeated enemy. It was with this murderous machine that our hero would have to fight soon, and Rifen himself wondered if he could win. Which of them would be stronger?